uh, a series of data-rich presentations, many of which are support and are crucial to our system-wide strategic planning efforts. So Vice Provost McMaster will soon present data on diversity in Twin Cities campus and undergraduate enrollment. And later this morning, Vice President Levine will focus on research investments and Chancellor Burr on enrollment planning at Morris. This afternoon in finance and operations, we'll discuss administrative cost definition and benchmarking, and much as we did last summer for the Twin Cities campus, we will provide you with data regarding student housing capacity and impact on the system campuses. And of course, board members received extensive data sets over the past month responding to questions on the non-resident, non-reciprocity population on the Twin Cities campus. Tomorrow, you will hear our annual financial report, which provides much information on the financial health of the university as a whole and our ability to execute our system-wide strategic plan. And when I join Provost Hansen in presenting our accountability report, I will discuss state funding and tuition issues while touching on our financial aid successes, growing demand for our programs, important changes in state and national demographics, and our unique position in the nation as we consider strategic plan priorities and issues. Uh, a flood of information indeed, but with real purpose and a shared goal to best inform our conversations and decisions around broader strategic questions and priorities. With that, Mr. Chair, I thank you for the chance to tee up our meetings uh, today and tomorrow, and I turn it back to you. Thank you, President Kaler. Um, in, in light of that, uh, data is always good, and we're going to hear some now in our first uh, agenda item, diversity in undergraduate education on the Twin Cities campus. Provost Hansen. Thank you, Sharon Omari and members of the committee. Uh, here today to help with the discussion, our Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Education, Bob McMaster, and Associate Vice Provost, Sean Garrick. Professor Garrick is a professor of mechanical engineering in the College of Science and Engineering and has recently begun a new role as Associate Vice Provost in the Office of Equity and Diversity. Today's agenda item is a continuation of the conversation about the university's commitment to diversity that began at a board meeting in spring 2017 with the proposal of a resolution and the decision to continue consideration of the relevant issues at a subsequent work session. We've worked very closely with the committee chair and the board office in order to shape today's session and the draft board resolution which will be presented later in this session. First. Vice Provost Bob McMaster is going to talk with us about some of this campus's multicultural recruitment initiatives. These initiatives have re uh, resulted in a 29% increase in the number of African American freshmen and a 52% increase in the number of Hispanic students on the Twin Cities campus in the last five years. But we continue to seek ways to uh, continue and indeed accelerate these trends. Programs like the North Star STEM Alliance are among the efforts on that front aimed at attracting and retaining students of color, in this case in STEM disciplines. Sean will tell us more about this alliance. Well, we're pleased to report that the first year retention rates for students of color now do not diverge from the general retention rate. The university still has a long way to go to improve the four and six year graduation rates for students of color. <clears throat> We need to understand all the factors that negatively uh, affect student success, many of which are non-academic, and we need to address those issues. Finally, again, I want to note that at the end of our remarks, we'll be introducing a resolution developed at the request of and in collaboration with members of the Board of Regents. In February 2017, in connection with the discussion of the Twin Cities five-year enrollment plan, a resolution was moved and seconded to amend that plan in order to increase enrollment of African-American and Latinx students on the Twin Cities campus <coughs> to a level reflective of these populations' numbers in the Twin Cities metro area. The resolution was discussed, and the board eventually decided to continue discussion of the issues connected with that resolution at a special full board work session, which was then held in June 2017, under the heading Diversity and Undergraduate Enrollment at the Twin Cities Campus, aligning the university's outcome with its outcomes with its aspirations. Uh, as you may recall, Julie Schweitzer of the College Readiness Consortium participated, Shakir Abdullah from Office of Equity and Diversity, and Mohammed Khalifa, who's a professor of, um, in the College of Education and Human Development. The expect expectation was that after that session, which focused mainly on building stronger pipelines, we would also return with a revised resolution focused on diversity in undergraduate education <coughs> in City's campus. We will do that today, offering for your consideration a resolution that's been shaped by those earlier board discussions 
about enrollment planning, the board work session, and continuing conversations with the committee chair and with members of our university community. So that will come at the end of our presentation, and I believe at that point uh, President Kaler will also want to speak to the resolution to set up discussion. But for now, I would like to turn the presentation over to Vice Provost McMaster and Associate Vice Provost Sean Garrix. Please. Yes, um, uh, Chair O'Murray and members of the board, today we'd like to fairly quickly go through some slides that you've had for a few weeks now, but um, add some additional detail. Um, I did also want to point out that in the docket material, there's a much larger set of slides with even more detail about uh, diversity on the Twin Cities campus. Um, so we can't do a deep dive into those, but they, they are in your materials. So now McMaster's having trouble getting to the next slide. There we go. So we wanted to make sure we were able to provide some system context here. Uh, and this slide shows over the last uh, five years or so the, the growth in uh, diversity, the increase in diversity on all of our campuses uh, year by year. I, I think it can be safely said that each of the campuses uh, has made progress, uh, perhaps not always the progress that we want, but uh, we're moving in, in a positive direction. The next slide uh, shows the disaggregated ethnic data, race ethnic data, uh, for the Twin Cities campus. There's one of these slides uh, in the docket material for each one of the system campuses. Mm -hmm. And again, category by category in terms of the primary groups here, American Indian, Asian, uh, Black, Hispanic, um, Hawaiian is a pretty small category at our university. Um, one can see the, the growth in these categories uh, over time. What I wanted to spend some time on early in the presentation is around the recruitment initiatives and the, the efforts that we make in terms of outreach. Uh, our admissions office does a terrific job here. And one of the first slides here is showing kind of the growth in activity uh, over the last five years in terms of the number of what we call multicult multicultural recruitment events. These are events that are specifically targeted for uh, students of color and American Indian students. Uh, one should add that there also are a lot of other uh, uh, multi or, or recruitment events that include multicultural students um, throughout the whole year. These are ones that are specifically targeted. Uh, you can see the total students in attendance, um, the total guest attendance, meaning parents and, and brothers and sisters who often come to these events as well. And then uh, finally, uh, for 2017, the growth uh, in these categories. So our, our admissions office has been extremely attentive to trying to build relationships. Uh, continuing with um, that, that theme, uh, this represents, this slide represents a growth in multicultural student visitors uh, in terms of the specific categories. These are students who come to campus or campus tours and other events um, throughout the year. Uh, as best we can, we record this so we know who we're reaching out to. Um, and we will continually touch base with these students after first contact. Uh, but again, one can see uh, that there's been an increase in these numbers. Um, and I won't dive into the, 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 the weeds here, but uh, basically a doubling of the overall effort in the last few years. And this graph simply builds on that, showing um, the increases uh, for total student visits and, the, and for each one of the individual categories, race, ethnic categories, uh, over time. Our admissions office also reaches out to the schools on a regular basis. This certainly does not represent the only set of schools that we uh, are in contact with. It's a, it's a sample. Um, but there are a whole set of visits where our admissions officers are out in these schools helping students complete their application to the University of Minnesota, talking about higher education. Uh, often our one-stop counselors go along to help students fill out the FAFSA, this ugly form that students have to fill out to get financial aid. Uh, and so um, we have constant outreach to a whole set of schools uh, and this really builds in many ways our, our relationships as well. 
Um, we also have a whole set of multicultural recruitment initiatives. Uh, one that we'll mention here in terms of outreach to the schools is called College Knowledge Month. Uh, that's in October where again there's outreach to the schools um, trying to talk about higher education, applying to the university, or applying to Minnesota State if that's more appropriate. It's basically trying to provide our expertise in admissions and enrollment uh, with our K-12 community. We also have multiple relationships with community partners. And again, we've listed just some of these partnerships with our Office of Admissions. Um, one that I'll mention specifically is the Northside Achievement Zone. Um, that's an effort to try to increase uh, uh, high school completion and college uh, uh, attainment uh, for Northside uh, students. Um, there's constant outreach with this group, again, talking about access to the University of Minnesota or higher ed in general. Uh, and for each one of these you see here, as well as many other community partners, um, we've established strong relationships to try to build the pipelines we want to have a multicultural student body. So I'd like to um, discuss a little bit about a focused effort in regards to STEM uh, graduation rates. This effort began in uh, roughly 2004, actually began a little bit before that, where NSF officials reached out to us um, suggesting that we actually submit a proposal for this program. This is the Lewis Stokes, oh, I forget the full acronym now, but it's the NSF program, with, um, the LSAT program whose goal, the goal of the program is to double the graduation, the number of graduates every four to five years um, in STEM. Um, so the way we formulated the program, um, we included all of the universities and colleges in the area, the 17 are listed here. It's really about a, a partnership such that we can feed as many people either into the University of Minnesota or into four-year institutions in the region that uh, produce uh, STEM graduates. Um, the, the colleges are listed um, on, on the slide. A big challenge when we formulated the program um, was how do we meet the numbers. In doing that, we engaged the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, I think they had, at the time, roughly three years of their own LSAM program. And the challenge that, uh, that they relayed to us was one of uh, retention rates. That is, they get a lot of students, but they don't find a way of um, keeping them for the four to five years to get a degree in science, engineering, and so on. Um, so when we formulated our program, we anticipated that challenge. Um, unfortunately, that challenge didn't really materialize. Um, the challenge we had was getting the number of students here at, on day one. The students who are going into STEM at the University of Minnesota campus, they are actually quite strong students, and for many years they were graduating at rates above the majority students. Um, so we expanded the partnership to, such that we can bring more students here, given our track record of actually um, graduating them. And that's how it got to 17. Um, some of the things that we do, um, it's, a lot, it's really about programming, that is finding ways to engage the students, um, nurture their interests, maintain their interest um, throughout the four years, connect what they're doing in the classroom with things that are going on in research and in industry. Um, so we also provide academic support to the students, and the way in which we do that is really peer-to-peer. -peer. That is, the students um, provide their academic, the academic support to each other. Um, for a number of years, we had uh, distinctions of fellows and scholars. The scholars would be the first path of entry into the program. The fellows would be scholars who have progressed a couple of years and have high GPAs and other um, indicators of academic success. And they would peer mentor other um, junior students. Um, we also connected them with research opportunities via Europe as well as um, uh, LSAM funded or North Star STEM funded research opportunities. Um, and some of them are, are listed here. Um, 
a, a big part of that is, you know, we, we leverage one of the unique aspects of the campus, and that is we have high quality research going on. Many of the partner institutions do not. So we actually bring some of those students to, to the campus. Um, some of the challenges that we've had is the aforementioned just getting a large number of people here on day one. Um, there is, uh, you know, I think we need to do a better job in terms of making contact within the community. Um, a lot of uh, investigation has shown that community members are sometimes suspect of the motivations of the university, um, so we need to find a way of bridging that. And of course, there's the, the cost issue. In terms of numbers, we've been doing quite well. Um, you see here from, from the inception um, to the projected rates from the class that entered last year, and all the numbers are going up, so the, the program is working. Of course, the challenge is, you know, um, again, we have to double every four to five years. So this means then, if we seek to renew in four to five years, we really have to um, put some significant effort into getting people here in the next two to three years. So we wanted to um, run through those uh, recruitment efforts and. Uh, what we want to do now is shift uh, shift gears a bit and start to talk about the actual admissions process a bit and, and where our numbers are. Uh, we wanted to put this slide in because it gets into some of the philosophy in terms of our of our uh, admissions office really uh, representing national standards uh, in, in enrollment. So the admissions office um, yeah, or, or the students uh, applying to our university uh, uh, provide any information on a voluntary basis. That's really a key piece of this. Uh, the information obviously is not used. Now it says logging off. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, um, time's up. Apparently, yeah. time's up. Presentation. So, do you have your? Uh, we, I can yes, continue yes, this presentation we without yep. the. We have our slides. Yeah, I'm just going to continue the presentation. Um, Regent Swigum, if we go over on time, it's not my fault. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Chairman, we all have white flags. We are waving at 11 o'clock. <laughs> okay, apologies for that. Uh, the Office of Admission uses the information, uh, the race and eth ethnicity information, uh, to really help plan for the different programs that the students might want to get involved with while they're here. Living and learning communities, uh, other multicultural uh, 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 clubs and events. Um, so the, the data are used in a planful way. Uh, and then we wanted to mention that we now have three application platforms, um, the Coalition app, um, the Common App and our own Golden Gopher application, uh, and I'm going to get into some of the race and ethnicity questions that are used uh, on, on that. The next slide, I believe, I'm hoping, says disaggregation of eth ethnicity and race data on the Golden Gopher application. Yes. Good. So, we have a change here that I think is worth noting. Uh, in the past, we have only asked, in terms of our own internal application, for the standard federal categories, the five federal categories of race and ethnicity. Um, this year, uh, we made a change, and we now are asking on the, on the Golden Gopher application for richer race and ethnicity data. In particular, we get asked many times each year about the Somali population and the Hmong population in the Twin Cities, how many students we have, how successful they, they are, and we really do not have good answers because they're included in the Asian category and the black African American category. So on our own application then, we uh, are now able to do a deeper dive Uh, and we now, for each of these categories, have disaggregated the, the, um, the, the boxes. So as an example, in the middle 
uh, uh, block you see under Asian, um, we now ask about Chinese, Hmong, Indian, Japanese, Korean, Pakistani, Filipino, and so on. Uh, given this, we will be able to, over time now, this is the first year we've done this, we will be able to gather these data at finer grain and to analyze these data over time in terms of student success. Um, I should add that uh, we do not have that same capacity with the Common App, and that's the, the major platform we're shifting to because they don't ask those questions. Um, they do have richer data than the five federal categories, but not to the same level we, we do in the Coalition App. Um, I wanted to make sure that uh, we were aware of how our Office of Admissions considers race in the, in the application process. Um, obviously, enrolling an academically qualified diverse student body is really uh, core to what we do in the admissions process. Um, we use a holistic review admissions process. We've talked about that many times. And basically, uh, our admissions office uh, touches base with general counsel to make sure that we are following um, the, the uh, judicial uh, uh, mandates that have come down around race and admissions. Uh, and I just wanted to put this slide up one more time to reemphasize the point that the data that we receive uh, on the admissions forms and application really is voluntary. It's voluntary information. So now uh, I wanted to shift and show some of the data and where we think we are in terms of recruitment and student success. So this particular slide shows the number of student of color uh, admission inquiries um, that we receive each year. And one can see, uh, th these are for Minnesota residents, I should add, um, that this number uh, has been going up each year. This represents in many ways the pool um, that we draw from. We have three of these graphs. Um, I think the full set uh, would be in the docket material. Um, but basically, this is showing for three of the uh, racial groups, race, ethnic groups, um, the number of applications that we've received, the number of offers that we make, and then the enrollment um, that uh, uh, we, we have in the fall. So the first graph shows um, the, the trends for the Asian population. The next graph shows the same data for the African American black population, and the third graph shows the same data for the Hispanic Latinx population. And we can certainly have conversations around that if you'd like. This slide, and again you have a fuller set of these in the docket material, shows the pool, the Minnesota pool that we draw from for students of color. So what this tells us is that 23.71% of Minnesota high school graduates are students of color. 20.84% uh, of um, uh, Minnesota graduates are students of color and take the ACT. And if I drop down uh, in terms of the, the different categories, 11%, uh, 10.84% of uh, uh, of high school graduates are students of color that are in the top 25% of the class and meet the ACT benchmarks that we use as an indicator of success at the university. Uh, we enroll in our class 26.65% students of color from Minnesota. So the other graphs are in the docket material. We have the same graph for underrepresented minority students. So uh, this is a parallel graph to the one you just saw. We have two additional graphs here, and I, it's going to be hard to believe, but the vice provost office made a mistake that we had to recalculate here. So we wanted to let you know about this. Um, we will get you a new copy of this graph. Um, the one you have does not look like this. And again, our apologies. Um, this graph shows, based on the percent high school graduates in a state and the percent students of color enrolling at the major flagship university in that state, what is the difference? Okay, so this shows that in the state of Washington, 
in the freshman class, they're 18% above um, the percent high school graduates coming out. It shows that for Minnesota, we're 1.4% above the, the uh, students of color, percent students of color in the high school graduating class. You can then see some of the states where we could say they're underperforming, if you like, in terms of diversity, where Texas is minus nine and Florida is minus 12. Okay, so we thought it was important to kind of look state by state at, at the pool and how well we're doing uh, in terms of drawing from that pool. Again, this is the same graph. This graph shows the same data for underrepresented uh, uh, minorities. And in this, uh, or for this graph, you can see we're underperforming uh, in terms of where we would like to be, but we still are doing better than other states if that becomes a basic metric. I wanted to shift to student success. Uh, this graph shows the disaggregated data for first year retention. And as Provost Hansen noted, uh, this is a place where we think we've made a lot of progress over the last few years. Um, last fall, we, we uh, sh showed you data that indicated that the first year retention rate for students of color actually exceeded that for uh, white students, non-students of color. This year it slid back a little bit, um, but the first year retention for our students of color is 93%, which I think represents uh, the success for, of, of a whole set of initiatives, including our recruitment process, recruitment for success, uh, our President's Emerging Scholars Program, um, the financial aid that we've been able to put on the table, uh, and as well as the, the MK and other multicultural uh, enhancement programs at the university. This slide shows the four-year graduation rate. And again, as Provost Hansen noted, this is a, a graph that is a bit more sobering. Uh, for certain uh, race and ethnic groups, we think we've made good progress. Uh, I'll, I'll pick Hispanic here where uh, we've raised the four-year graduation rate from 44% to 63%. Um, I thought we were making solid progress with the African-American black category in this year. We just saw these data several weeks ago. We actually slid backwards uh, six points on that graduation rate. So what this shows is, in many ways, the fragility of some of these rates. Um, we would be dealing with smaller numbers in some of these categories, but nonetheless, it represents a lot of work that we have to do because our goal is to zero the difference between these graduation rates. That's, that's really uh, um, the only acceptable long-term, long, long-term long goal. Um, we have the six-year graduation rates, same graph, and you can see again in certain instances, I think we've made very solid progress in improving the six-year graduation rate for students of color. Uh, and in other instances, we have a fair amount of work to do. But I will point out this year, uh, our, our six-year graduation rate for the first time ever has exceeded 80%. Uh, and so we look at how close are the different categories to that 80%, and African-Americans at 75, Hispanics at 76. So the six-year rate is more promising than the four-year rate. But as I've said many times, the four-year rate is really our gold standard on how well students are doing here. Finally, wanted to get through this before the computer <coughs> shut down again. Um, the final slide is, uh, shows some of the results from our CERU, the, the Survey of Engagement at the Research University, which is our major survey instrument that we give to all undergraduates um, two out of every three years. It's a long survey. There are, are probably close to 100 questions on this, but it provides very rich data to us on how well our students are doing and how they feel about this university. Uh, this is a survey that's used by the University of California system. They designed it, Berkeley designed it, and it's used by many of our peers, Texas, North Carolina, Ohio State, Michigan, uh, um, uh, Maryland and basically our peers use CIRU. We've migrated away from the other survey called NESI to CIRU. At any rate, we have four 
questions on the CERO, there are actually a few others that really get to the heart of campus climate and how well our, all of our students are feeling about diversity and we can chart here, uh, in fact, how our students of color are feeling about campus climate uh, in a variety of categories. You can see the data here. Um, that also becomes part of the resolution. So with that, I'll finish. Uh, I think Provost Hansen was now going to introduce the resolution. No, we've introduced the resolution. Yeah, okay. So you have the resolution. I think President Kaler was going to make a few remarks uh, on the resolution, and then I think we're open for questions and discussion. Thank you to the presenters. President Kaler. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, and thank you, Vice Provost McMaster. Uh, one of the roles I take most seriously is to help ensure that our actions match our values, and this resolution will help us be accountable to that spirit. And we regularly say, and it is embedded in board policy, that advancing equity and diversity is a top institutional priority. Serving the state and our communities is included in our charter, and this resolution will be true to our policy and will help us hold it be accountable for our actions. If we want to attract more diverse students, keep them on our campus, hear from them when they are enrolled and see them graduate and learn from them after they graduate and understand they will have a high quality experience, that requires strong commitment and unwavering support from everyone. I'm committed to, re I am committed to reinforcing at every turn our commitment to this priority and to fostering a welcome campus climate inclusive of all. And I look forward to our continued focus and discussion on this very important issue and on this resolution that is before you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, President Kaler. Uh, just a few notes uh, before we open up the floor. Number one, I believe Regent Simmons is on the phone, so welcome. Um, we'll be looking to you if you Thank have you. any comments. Um, secondly, keep in mind, members, this the resolution is for review, so we won't be amending, we won't be voting on it today, but it's an opportunity for us to have a conversation. I want to note that the General Counsel's Office has been involved in crafting the resolution as well as a legal expert in the College of Education. In addition to that, I want to give um, a quick credit to the student representatives who in their report last year talked about the disaggregation of student data and um, thank the administration for the response to that. And then lastly, just mention that this resolution is in conjunction with the conversation about the Twin Cities enrollment plan. That's why it's focused on the Twin Cities. This is not a um, uh, 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 Ex this is a, a conversation that will extend to other campuses um, as we continue moving this work forward. So I don't want us to think that we're uh, excluding any other campuses by uh, having a conversation specifically about the Twin Cities. Questions and comments? Regional, Regional Murray, when it's convenient, I'd like to speak. Please, Regent Simmons. Well, thank you very much. I think this is a question for you and for the president or provost, um, and actually it's a part of a series of questions. And the first question I have is why do we need a resolution? I will tell you I'm impressed um, with the specific actions the university administration has undertaken, and I'm impressed with the progress that's been made. So I just would like to know why we need a resolution. Is it to sanction the work in progress? Is it to catalyze doing more? So that's sort of my first question. My second, I'm gonna batch these because you can answer them all at once. My, my second question is uh, about focusing on the Twin Cities. I know it's the largest by number um, population of underrepresented m minority candidates and the demographics will um, continue to lead to that being a fact. We also have communities in other parts of the state that have had pretty dramatic changes in their demographics too with um, growing uh, underrepresented minority populations. And since we're not a City University or a regional university or a state university, uh, and the Twin Cities campus is a state campus. Just want to know if we are doing the right thing in selecting the emphasis to be on the Twin Cities. Maybe the biggest gain, but will it potentially, because of the effort involved and the expense involved, um, disadvantage uh, students in, in, in other parts of the state? 
And then the third part of my question is, I, I think with any enrollment strategy, including one to increase not only the diversity of our campus, but the graduation rates of a diverse population, I think that needs to be a system-wide effort. So direct linking to the other campuses to me is important. Um, those are my comments. And again, please understand that, that my um, statements, my questions are grounded in excitement about the activities that are going on, excitement about the progress, strong commitment to even greater accomplishment. But I'd like to hear a response to those three areas of questions. Who would like to start? I think President Kaler answered a little bit of, of some of those questions, so perhaps I'll turn to you first in, in taking a stab at that and then we can... Sure, thank you, uh, Chair Omari. Uh, I think uh, the, the need for a resolution is uh, really an opportunity to put a clear flag in the ground and state that this is important to us going forward and to reinforce our operational commitment to this, uh, to this work. I don't think there's any more or less uh, to it uh, than that. Uh, indeed, we are focusing on the Twin Cities uh, right now. Uh, again, uh, it is by far the largest campus, and uh, it is the campus in the metropolitan area that has the largest uh, proportion uh, of minority uh, students graduating from high school, so it seems to me to be the obvious place to start. Uh, the commitment to diversity, of course, uh, is uh, across our campus, uh, across all of our campuses, across our system, uh, and we'll, uh, we will continue uh, to be focused on that. Vice Provost McMaster or Provost Hanson, anything else you'd like to add in those comments? Please. If not, that's fine. No. Please, Provost Hanson. Um, thank you, Chair Omari and, and Regent Simmons and members of the committee. I, I, I think we would want to underscore that this isn't um, uh, to the exclusion of the efforts connected with the other campuses and with statewide efforts. One of the things that Vice Provost McMaster and I think um, uh, Professor Garrick also were clear about was that the efforts uh, of admissions and the efforts to uh, build student success extend throughout the, the um, uh, populations that are coming from a variety of places. Part of the, uh, the reason for focusing as we did on, in um, this resolution was that it, it both came out of the, the earlier board discussion but it, it also was related to the concerns that were noted and then uh, at the work session about the way in which the Twin Cities area has a growing um, uh, set of disparities with respect to racial categories and we in turn have at the Twin Cities campus a variety of opportunities to engage in, with the K through 12 system and uh, you know can in addition to our engagement, which is, has a variety of aims, it, it build on that engagement to build new pipelines. Again, that's not to the exclusion of pipelines from elsewhere in Minnesota. So I think that's part of what was uh, setting the context for this. Thank you, Provost Hanson. Uh, Vice Provost McMaster, please. Yes, Chair, Chair Omari, members of the committee, one of the parts of the resolution that I think is important is it establishes some goals for us in terms of graduation rates and closing the SERU gaps around our, our um, uh, campus climate. And those are good goals for us to have in administration as we push to, to have even stronger success with our multicultural students. So I think that's a positive part of the resolution. Thank you. Regent Hsu. Thank you, Chair Amari. Um, I <clears throat> just had some thoughts on the resolution I wanted to share. I believe uh, in the work session that we had um, several months ago, I had brought up uh, specific uh, issues regarding uh, diversity in some of our colleges. And this resolution doesn't quite get down to the college level, and I, I'm just kind of wondering you know, how we're going to address um, the lack of diversity in some of our colleges through this resolution or other another resolution that may need to be advanced. Vice Provost McMaster? Um, yes, um, Chair O'Murray and Regent Shu, I think you're correct that uh, the, uh, there's variance, some significant variance 
uh, in the diversity in our colleges. Uh, each one of those colleges is, a ver is very attentive to that. Um, they look carefully at the pool information that um, we went through in this presentation. Um, I think it would constrain the admissions process if we started to drill down and establish specific metrics at the collegiate level. Uh, I, I think we were starting at the, at the university-wide level. We're attentive to it. Uh, over time, we hope to make progress, but I, I do think it would be rather, it would constrain our admissions office given the fact that we do admit to seven freshmen admitting colleges to have exact metrics or goals, which we, we can't anyway, uh, uh, around um, diversity. Regent Hsu. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Omari, I was maybe going to ask you what you mean by constrained and how how we would be constrained in uh, looking at the college level. Sure. Vice um, Provost yeah, Chair Omari and Regent Shu, members of the committee. Um, as, we, as we look at the pool we draw from, for instance, and I'll take the College of Science and Engineering as an example, uh, one of the things we look for in admission to science and engineering specifically are scores in math courses, grades in math courses in high school, as well as the sub-scores within ACT or SAT and other indicators of quantitative mathematical ability. Uh, we, we often see that there's differences in, in the pools uh, on these metrics and we, we, we may not have the pool um, to increase the diversity right now in certain colleges. Over time we're hoping to do that um, through some of the strategies, but I think at this moment it would create difficulties in, in perhaps reaching the enrollment targets for the various colleges. Uh, Provost Hanson? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Omari and Regent Schubert. May I just add that it's bec because we have so many undergraduate admitting colleges and some of them have uh, majors that might best be described as discovery majors, they're, 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 they're focused on things that aren't necessarily taught in high school, that's certainly true of departments. There can be so many other factors um, playing a role in whether or not a student at, uh, thinks of something as a possible major. And I don't want to pick on a particular college or major because I'll get in trouble with that. But I, you know, I think, for example, even of my own major philosophy, uh, and you know, maybe math is something else. But the philosophy one isn't necessarily something that. Um, Every, every student might think of in high school as a, as a major in this, you know, maybe I will get in trouble with this, but something like the College of Design uh, has a number of majors that might not be the first thought of particularly uh, students coming from families where, where there hasn't been um, a, a parent in college yet. So the issue of, of how pipelines are built and what colleges seem like they have the obvious opportunities may depend a little bit on, so, on fa socioeconomic factors and historical factors that are quite complicated to play into the admissions decision. So that's kind of another reason why that would be quite difficult. Thank you. Regent Powell? Uh, thank you, Chair Amari. Um, and um, presenters, let me just start by saying um, I really appreciate the data and uh, which really highlights the progress that we're making and the opportunities that we have. It's very transparent. I think it's easy to follow. And, um, uh, and it's also great to see the progress that um, you know, your team has made across a wide range of initiatives. So I appreciate all that. And I also uh, really applaud you for the strong cultivation efforts and recruiting efforts you know, that have you broadened you know, across uh, high schools. and across the state, so I'm really encouraged by it, um, the report. Um, two, two questions, um, as you noted, the four-year graduation rates, particularly for African Americans, I think are discouraging, uh, and, and you, you noted that they've fallen back and they don't appear to be very stable. Um, encouragingly, the six-year rates are quite quite a bit higher. I mean, the gap is much narrower. So I'm wondering if you could maybe give us a few thoughts and theories on um, how you're going to approach that um, that kind of challenge, which I think is really is one of the one of the um, bigger ones uncovered in the report. And the other question has to do with the Seru survey, um, and I think you. Uh, um, 
the vice provost uh, commented on the the gap um, in that survey uh, and students saying um, that they feel respected in the community it's a pretty big gap and I just again uh, am interested in your thoughts and ideas on what might um, explain that and, and that one's troubling as well I think and how um, if we have any ideas on how we're going to pursue that and address it and I offer both of you all the opportunity to take a stab at those uh, Chair Omari and Regent Powell I'll, I'll tackle the four-year rate question first um, I when we saw these data a few weeks ago we were obviously very disappointed because we thought we were on a good trajectory and we thought the programs we'd put in place around admitting for success and um, the president's emerging scholars and the other other programs were working so I don't I don't have a good answer right now in terms of specific initiatives we'll put in place we will over the next month be going back um, very quickly to to disaggregate those graduation rates to figure out is it a collegiate problem um, is it a, an issue of geography that non-resident students students of color african-american students are doing less well than resident students uh, is it a matter of, of internal or initial preparation as students come in so there are myriad variables that we're going to have to look at that likely could have affected those rates and so uh, I, I, I think I'm going to have to get back, um, in, unless I do a lot of conjecture here on exactly what happened. In terms of moving forward, once we identify those, those problems, um, we will move systematically one by one to try to figure out what we can do to enhance those. In terms of your second question, and I think um, Professor Garrick might have some thoughts here as well, uh, the, the the campus climate uh, ha, has always been a, a bit um, difficult for our students of color in large part because we don't have a large number of students of color and we hear uh, our students often saying we don't see a lot of students <coughs> like us on this campus uh, and that's something that through MK uh, and other other organizations they they try to, to build a sense of camaraderie and, and belongingness I think a lot of this is based on national and state trends as well and pressures that are coming in external pressures to the university on um, bad things that are happening in our society that affect uh, people of color and students of color and uh, the sense of well-being uh, on our on our campus. Professor Garrett. Uh, Chair Amari, Regent Powell, members of the committee. Um, Regarding the four-year uh, graduation rate and the six-year rate, I agree with Provost McMaster. I think a bit of conjecture on my part would be needed there, but I suspect it could be a lot of college differences, meaning if you really were to look into it, you would see differences um, in, in various colleges. Of course, the college I'm most familiar with, uh, CSE, um, I suspect you would not see much of a gap there in the four-year rate, and a big reason is CSE graduates don't have much of a problem finding jobs. So if you look at the financial prospect of extending that graduation rate a year or two versus the lost income, that's a very negative prospect. Um, but I think you would really need to look into a college by college basis to see where that gets, to, um, what may be going on there. Um, in regards to the SARA data, again, I, I agree with Provost um, McMaster in the sense that I think a lot of it comes down to the university is fairly large. It can be viewed as very intimidating, very alienating, but you have to find ways of creating pockets of community. Um, this is something that we did in the North Star STEM program to really um, let the students know, yes, you are going to a, to a campus with thousands of students, but it turns out you're taking classes with the same 20 to 40 people every day right. and just reinforcing that to, to not let them get too afraid of the process. Thank you. And in that uh, disc, when you when you all dig into that data, I'd be curious to see if there um, are resident um, differences by where students are coming from. So if they're coming from uh, outstate rural versus the seven county metro, if there's differences in those graduation rates across the um, demographics as well, including white students, I think that'd be interesting to see. Uh, Regent Beeson, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. This has been uh, uh, this has been very helpful. We have made. Um, uh, we have made um, uh, progress. Um, 
going to the resolution, the and I do like goals. I like metrics. Um, I'm a little concerned about the that the goal that we have in place, 50% by 2025, is not realistic. Um, that means that for students matriculating in 2019, we expect that cohort of students six years later to have halved the uh, uh, the, the graduation rate. It just feels aggressive. The other thing is that the this is a progress card like goal and we're making we're introducing a new metric that's really important but without also looking at the other metrics that the progress card demands occasionally so I would prefer to have a goal like this inside the rest of the conversation we have with the progress card probably belongs there but uh, to do it in isolation is a little a little concerning um, the other comment I would make going back to recruiting, and you're going to hear me talk about this during NRNR, we made progress in relationship building and events and um, um, networking, all that is happening, but it feels to me like we need to be more assertive on, the, on recruiters, not just recruiting. And recruiters the in business parlance are the closers and the salespeople. And we know from the information you've given us on NRNR that those people, their salaries pay for themselves with just a very modest success rate in closings. So why not apply that same energy that we're going to do in NRNR with urban students or a longer system campus? It's a very different mindset. That's people who are well compensated, who are commission based partly, but who but who can be successful to attract the students that want a more direct conversation, one on one conversation, uh, to get them to to uh, uh, attend here. And I think you know, we're losing hundreds of students of color out of the cities of Minneapolis and Saint Paul high schools. And I don't know if they're being called individually, but in a business, if those were our target customers, they'd be called, there'd be a list, and they'd be called, they'd be, be visited, and, they, and and I know we're doing a lot of that. I know you're doing, we're doing much more than we've ever done, but I just think this is an area where we can apply some business best practice going forward, and I'll talk about this further at NRNR. Thank you, Regent Beeson. I think that's a, a great idea, actually, to think about between now and February, how we can add a metric to the, to the progress card. In addition to that, I think number one and two in the resolution under, under the be it uh, resolved get exactly at that recruiting effort that you're talking about um, on this level as well. Regent Swiggum. Mr. Chairman, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. McMaster, if I could, uh, two questions. Um, um, the first is, first of all, I think congratulations. And uh, performance has been improving except for that four-year gold standard graduation for black students that you mentioned uh, in the last year. Other than that, the numbers all look to be going in the same direction. Uh, first question is this, uh, besides racial diversity, what other type of diversities do we seek uh, at this campus? Uh, geographic, political, um, give me some other uh, uh, diversity items that we might want to be seeking. Vice Provost McMaster. Um, yes, Chair Omari and uh, Regent Swiggum. Uh, we certainly in increasingly are looking at the, the geographical diversity. Uh, in particular, an issue that the board has raised over the last few years would be the greater Minnesota versus suburban versus urban diversity that we have on campus with some concerns about the, the percent of greater Minnesota students we enroll that's been going up. That's uh, obviously where my question is coming from. Uh, and, and so we're pleased with that. Uh, we also have a gender diversity on campus. Um, we have in the freshman class 54% uh, 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 women coming in and 46% men. And so there's a gender imbalance there. It's a national, it's a national number, it's not unique to us. Uh, it varies college by college. Science and engineering is more male dominated. Biological sciences is more uh, female dominated. Uh, uh, apropos to Regent um, Shu's point about college differences. Um, so we look at that. Uh, we don't think it's an issue, but we look at that. Um, we've been increasingly looking, uh, building off the, the geographical question about Minnesota reciprocity and NRNR or national students. 
and what the balance is there. We see we see different uh, performance from the different groups, and so we're attentive to that. So I, I think we normally talk about diversity broadly defined, which includes a lot of these categories. Mr. Chairman, thank you, uh, Mr. McMaster. I appreciate tracking those things and improving our diversity in all areas, gender, geographic, political. <laughs> Um, as, as an aside, I strongly support geographic diversity. <laughs> He's a geographer. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't touch on one of the issues I raised, but that's, that's fine. Um, and Mr. McMaster, my second question is, uh, as I look at the resolution, and Mr. Chairman, I understand it's for discussion today, mm -hmm. um, and, and I appreciate the goals as opposed to quotas. I'm not into quotas in any way, shape, or form. I appreciate the goals. I'm wondering as I look at number three on the to be resolved, and I think it was mentioned either by Regent Beeson, uh, just touched on by uh, Regent Beeson or Powell, it, it almost seems that number three gets into um, uh, a comparison of a direct linking of groups. Um, would it not be better to just uh, focus number three on enhancing the graduation rates of uh, the gap, uh, increasing that, that performance of African American blacks or Hispanics, as opposed to comparing them to other groups. Uh, you know, I, I think whites were at graduation rate of 71%. Uh, the uh, six year rate's 80%. Uh, four year rate was 71%? Oh, I, I'm sorry. The four year rate for all students is 68%. Okay. Um, I think for whites it was 71, if yeah. I remember correctly, from the, yeah. is what I said. I think I remember that. I'm, I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for uh, blacks it had dropped to 44 from the 52. As comparing the gap, wouldn't it be better to say we, we want the white graduation rate to get to 80 and 91 and 96 and 97 percent? And we want the uh, black graduation rate, rather than just Closing the gap just improve everybody to enhance everybody every group's graduation It's kind of like in football. Mr. McMaster, you know, we we, we want to get more wins We want to get better. It'd be great if Ohio State and Wisconsin and Michigan would stay where they are But they want to get better too, you know um, So wouldn't I, I'm just thinking looking at number three which dangerously close comes to a quote I, I don't think it does we dangerous close. It's a goal yeah. I think our goal should be take that group and increase the four year grad gold standard four year graduation rate by five percent each year until twenty twenty five as opposed to comparing it to another group that we want they want to be keep increasing that rate too do I make any sense or yes. Yes. just a suggestion yeah and and uh, one quick note before you go is is that there is a on a, on our progress card there is an overall graduation rate goal that we're looking for um, that is quite that's separate from this, but please, Vice Provost McMaster. Yes, yeah, so Chair Omari and Regent Swing and members of the committee. Um, I, I'm going to have to deliver some bad news here this morning, which there are limits to graduation rates. And so uh, as we kind of look at that four year rate and, and we can look at our peers, it's unlikely it's going to be impossible that that four year rate would ever be 100%. It's totally never, it's never going to be ninety percent. It probably is never going to be eighty percent. To be honest, we're we're hoping to get to seventy percent in the next few years. So there's not a lot of additional progress we're going to be making on a number of these rates. For instance, the very best four-year publics uh, uh, in the country really have maximum six-year rates of about eighty-five percent. There are very few institutions that exceed eighty-five percent on that simply because at a large university like ours you're going to expect that 15 percent of the students will transfer will drop out so it does become meaningful to look at the gap and this is kind of a national metric to make sure that we're closing that gap uh, we understand how we can do that and so we think that that's a, an ambitious to regent beeson's point but doable goal to reduce that by half, maybe even make more progress than that. Mr. McMaster, Mr. Chairman, Mr. McMaster, I understand we'll never get to the 100 percent, probably even never the 90 percent. I still stand by what I said. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Regent Rosha, and then we'll have uh, Student Representative Yulin, and then Regent Johnson. 
Thank you, Chair Omari. Um, I want to go all the way back to um, uh, just touch on the points that uh, Regent Simmons kicked off this uh, conversation with respect to the Twin Cities campus versus the system. Um, I, I think that that's a very good point. I mean, we, we have to look at, at, at our role as a system, and, and I think she made that point very well. Um, I do think that it makes sense um, to, to look uh, specifically at the Twin Cities campus, not even so much because it's geographically located in a more diverse part of the, of the state, but, but, but just the, the sheer reality that it's the campus where we have demand that exceeds, uh, greatly exceeds our capacity to admit. And so when I look at diversity issues, and I've said this before, um, you know, I think it's a critical issue. I, I, I look at it from the standpoint of barriers. Um, to access, barriers to success, as opposed to we need to be able to tell the world we're meeting these percentages, um, because that's really how you change lives, because sometimes there are personal preferences and, and other things that are, that are at play um, in all these things, as we see even with who's admitted by gender, you know, that there are some preferences being reflected there um, to a large extent. But um, so that being said, I, you know, you can see by the graph where you saw the preparation or, the, or the, the sort of index of the students from different populations versus admission or versus, the, you know, we're already, we're already trying to get at that. We've had conversations about ACT, optional questions and stuff that also would, I think, address some of those things. Um, and so when we talk about the Twin Cities campus, I think that that does warrant a specific observation um, for that purpose. I, I, I am concerned, and I, and I really appreciate this conversation, and I appreciate the, the candor as um, uh, I suppose Pro, Provost McMaster is talking about what's happening at the various campuses. But I cringe when I hear that we have these differences, these, these vast differences between the different uh, colleges, because I, I certainly wouldn't want us to suggest that we're saying, well, these, can these colleges will be responsible for meeting our diversity goals but those populations don't really have access to becoming engineers. Um, I think that's a really, really dangerous thing to, to, to sort of accept as a reality. And that's really where I think we start to, again, change the dynamic um, by, by ensuring that the barriers to those opportunities, um, you know, even if there are things that are well beyond our control, things that are starting in early childhood, in, in K uh, E12 education, I think that that's all uh, really, really important. Um, and finally, I just want to note, and this, this stems a little bit from uh, comments that, that the chair made and uh, um, to some extent the last exchange uh, between Regents Figum um, and the staff. It, the, I think it's really important that we break down the, the, this data beyond sort of these broad groups. Um, when, when we've talked about African American students or we've talked about uh, Asian American students, <coughs> You know, com coming from a practice on Selby Avenue in St. Paul for a decade, I can tell you there are vastly different experiences between different groups within these categories. Um, recent immigrants and, and, and re recent immigrants from different parts of the world. And so really being able to break it down and understanding more about those specific communities, I think is very, very helpful. I also think that we do at some point have to start looking at the fact that the largest demographic group, at least for now, uh, remaining white students, there is a vast difference in the experience within different communities within the white community. Um, one, of the, one of the obvious ones now is the geographic uh, difference, folks that are coming from um, outside of the Twin Cities area. So as, as we go forward, I wanna, I, my expectation is that we look at the, at the, different, camp, uh, the different collegiate units, um, as brought up by um, my, my colleague, Regent Shu, and, and uh, make sure that we're not just accepting those realities, um, but that we're really looking at providing access and reducing the barriers and providing the support. Final point, um, I think it's really telling that when you have these programs um, that uh, Professor Garrick was mentioning, and you set these expectations for students coming in, that has a huge impact on their success while they're here. You know, certainly people that grow up in a large metropolitan area are comfortable in a large metropolitan area, just making sure that they understand when they get to this campus that there is a community component to it. So I'm very pleased to hear about that and anything we can do to support and, and, uh, and grow those efforts, uh, I think is, is great for the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Student Representative Ulin. Thank you, Chair Omari, members of the board. Um, I would like to first thank you on behalf of my fellow student representatives for the inclusion of the disaggregation of ethnicity and race data. Uh, that is much appreciated. 
Um, on another note, I do also have two questions. Uh, so the focal point of this conversation was really our efforts within the state of Minnesota and um, how we can increase and encourage diversity that way. But could you also touch on some of the efforts that we are currently making or will make um, outside of the state, especially in relation to the implementation of higher tuition for NRNR students? Vice Provost McMaster. Yes, uh, Chair Omari and Representative Uland, I, I'm not crystal clear on your question here, so yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll make a run at it. And if I don't, if I don't uh, land on the target, let me know. Most of the diversity in our freshman class and at the university is shaped by residents from Minnesota. Uh, and so we have much lower diversity that comes in from um, our non-resident population. In part, that's planful because of all the programs that I discussed. We really want to be attentive to the diversity in our state and making sure that we provide access to the university. Uh, in terms of how the increases, potential increases in non-resident tuition will affect students of color coming in, um, a lot of that deals with the amount of financial aid we can put on the table or discounting uh, and recruitment um, that we have in place to try to mitigate against the concern about rising tuition. Okay. Uh, and I might note that this is going to be a larger discussion in the uh, afternoon committee, and I imagine that recruitment will come up in that conversation as well. Uh, Regent Johnson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Dr. McMaster, and your staff for the information. Uh, this may be a little deep of the weeds, but it, uh, trying to understand this issue further, looking at the issue of applications, admits, and enrollment yield, and I'm looking, and it doesn't have a page number here, but it has to do with Hispanics and the black uh, community. And let me use 2017. You had 388 uh, admits, but only 193 uh, enrolled. So that's 95 people that were admitted to the University of Minnesota did not attend. If you go to another chart, there's 463 admitted, but only 245 enrolled. You do the calculations, it's well over 300 students that were admitted to the University of Minnesota. I'm curious, why did they not attend? Vice Provost McMaster. Uh, Chair Murray and uh, Regent Johnson, members of the committee, there are lots of reasons why they didn't attend. Uh, one reason is that they had a better financial aid offer from another institution. Uh, another is that they felt another university was a better fit for them. Um, what I can assure you of is that our admissions office, uh, related to previous parts of this conversation, reached out to those students multiple times through the year and encouraged them to come to this university. Constant touch points, phone calls, um, especially around multicultural recruitment to try to make sure we can increase these numbers. But uh, we, we could go actually and, and do a study. We've done some of this through the National Clearinghouse. Um, in specifically around students of color who don't come here and find out where they went. We know this for the overall student body, but not so much for students of color. And, and perhaps one thing to be quite honest is they looked at our four-year graduation rate and made a correlation between their chances of success in graduating in four years, which is why that ties directly into our recruitment efforts as well. So with that, um, colleagues and presenters, thank you. Um, as noted, this is a, a resolution for discussion. I welcome uh, conversation along with uh, the vice chair of this committee, the provost, Vice Provost McMaster as well, um, as we continue this conversation between now and February. Thank you. Next up, um, we will hear a presentation that is a, a second part of several parts throughout the year regarding the 21st Century Outreach Mission. And today we will focus specifically on public engagement. And I will turn to the Provost for introductory remarks. Thank you, Cheryl Omari and um, Vice Chair Simmons, if you're still on the phone, and members of the committee. Uh, as the chair noted, today's discussion is the second of three planned by this committee to focus on the university's 21st century outreach mission as an integral part of our tripartite mission of research and discovery, teaching and learning, and outreach and public service. 
in part one, in, which, which was at the October meeting, uh, we highlighted the importance of extension and the research and outreach centers with their roots in our founding as one of the country's original land grant institutions and the scope and impact of current work reaching throughout the state. Today's presentation focuses on the university's statewide engagement efforts. Following the earlier session and preceding a third session, which might highlight some focused outreach activities on our, of our campuses and our other schools and colleges, and which will aim to adumbrate an overall vision of the university's outreach mission in the 21st century, Today's session will highlight how our multifaceted outreach mission has remained continuous with the land grant idea of universities sharing knowledge for the public good. But it will also highlight how, in addition to an emphasis on service uh, and a more linear process of delivering knowledge to the public, we've developed a new kind of engagement mission one integrating research and teaching and emphasizing reciprocal collaboration with community partners. As noted in the docket and background for today's discussion, the university has been recognized as a national leader in advancing a broad-based uh, strategic agenda for public engagement, one that's increasingly important to constituencies beyond the university and the government agencies and foundations that fund research. Reciprocal public engagement is woven into the academic plans of colleges and departments and into the strategic plans of our campuses. It is, in particular, a central component of the strategic plan for the Twin Cities campus, an important component of one of the four main pillars of that plan. We're joined here today by Andy Furco, Associate Vice President for Public Engagement. We'll say a bit more about how the university is advancing the 21st century outreach mission through a com comprehensive public engagement agenda. He'll then introduce three co-presenters who will provide examples of the broad range of engagement activities that advance the university's mission. We'll then look forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you, Provost Hansen. Welcome to the presenters and Associate Vice President Furco, please. Thank you. Uh, Chair Amari, members of the board, uh, thank you for this opportunity to present today. Uh, on the screen are five questions that were addressed uh, in the docket, and they focus on identifying the 21st century outreach agenda, the, the extent and impact of the university's outreach activities and some of the issues we're tackling regarding how to best account for the full range and scope of our outreach activities. Our presentation builds on the information presented in the docket report that was presented to the board. At land-grant universities like the University of Minnesota, outreach-focused activities and units such as extension, research, and outreach centers have for decades played a major important role in fulfilling the university's outreach mission to serve the needs of the state. And in advancing a 21st century outreach agenda, the question that arises is, what is the role of outreach in units whose primary function is not outreach? That is, academic and affiliated units whose primary roles are research and or teaching. And while the tripartite mission of research, teaching, and outreach is present in all of our academic units, outreach may not always feature prominently and can sometimes be overshadowed by academic units, research, and teaching priorities. The expansion and deepening of outreach activities within units whose primary functions are research and teaching is the central goal of the university's 21st century public engagement agenda, as Provost Hansen mentioned. This agenda is designed to support the efforts of academic and academic affiliated units seeking to shed more light on outreach and to expand their capacity for deepening engagement of their faculty, students, and staff in mutually beneficial, reciprocally engaged efforts that meet the needs of partnering communities and stakeholders across the state and beyond, while also advancing the research and teaching missions of the university. With this 21st century uh, a public engagement agenda in play, the range and scope of outreach activities are expanding across the state and beyond as more faculty and students and staff are making community outreach central to their work. These academically based activities, outreach activities continue to increase on every campus and in every college. They take place in every corner of the state engage a broad range of external stakeholders and produce many positive impacts on a multitude of issues from keeping rural roads drift free 
to creating a thousand jobs in North Minneapolis, to expanding renewable energy options for low income residents, to enhancing economic revitalization of rural and urban communities, and the list goes on and on. These efforts go beyond individual faculty or student efforts and focus on building collaboratives in which faculty and students and staff partner with external stakeholders and together enact collective action that integrates research, teaching, and outreach to address issues that matter to external stakeholders. 30 academic departments from across the system, assistant, system excuse me, have enacted robust strategic engagement plans designed to align their departmental curricula and scholarship to the changing needs of communities. And as mentioned in the DACA materials, all five campuses of the system are working to elevate outreach in their academic programs. Morris, Rochester, and the Twin Cities have completed campus-wide 21st century public engagement plans designed to elevate and deepen the outreach agenda, and the advancement of outreach efforts remain brisk at Crookston and Duluth. The docker material also included a link to more than 130 units that are recalibrating their research and teaching efforts to ensure greater university impact on communities across the state and beyond. Each of those off units offers a catalog of diverse outreach activities. So to offer some examples of this work, I will now turn the microphone over to my colleagues whose work in integrating outreach in their research and teaching efforts is not only impacting communities and stakeholders across the state in many positive ways, but is also enhancing faculty capacity for garnering additional research grants and advancing students' educational success and preparation for the workforce. And so I now turn to my colleague. We have here Professor Sheila Riggs, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Primary Dental Care at the School of Dentistry. She will be followed by Joe Polasek, who is a graduate student in the Master of Urban Planning program at the Humphrey School for Public Affairs, of Public Affairs, and also working with the Center for Sustainable Building Research at the College of Design, and Professor Kevin Linderman, Curtis L. Carlson, Professor in Supply Chain Operations from the Carlson School of Management. Professor Riggs. Thank you, Dr. Furco. It's a privilege to be here and talk about the School of Dentistry's community engagement and its alignment to our teaching, research, scholarship, and outreach. The main way uh, the, which we do the outreach has been incorporated in uh, throughout the dental school curriculum is through um, a course and through our dental clinics uh, that are uh, throughout Minnesota. The School of Dentistry has implemented a required course what we call the Senior Outreach Experience course for all three student types at our school, the dental students, dental therapy, and dental hygiene student curriculum during their senior year. Students typically spend around 10 weeks providing care to underserved patient populations in community clinics, federally qualified community clinics, Indian Health Service and tribal clinics. Uh, the map in front of you shows the brick and mortar clinics. Uh, I know Regent Johnson is familiar with our uh, clinic in Wilmer. And of note, our Hibbing Clinic is where we cohabitate uh, with the Minnesota State, or formerly known as MinSQ, system. We also have a mobile dental clinic that goes to 11 additional sites uh, all across Minnesota. A requirement of the course is that the students must enter their patient encounter information into the school's database, and that's what feeds our research and scholarship. In terms of student impact, in 2016 alone, our students treated and improved the oral health of over 15,000 Minnesotans, virtually all on Medicaid, which means they had no other access uh, to dental care. Students reported through the database that they provided over $6.4 million worth of dental services to patients across the state. But also please note, uh, Medicaid reimbursement for that is nowhere near $6.4 million. It's about 50 cents to the dollar. In addition to clinical experiences, students have the opportunity to provide community health education, they meet with school children of all ages across Minnesota and inspire them to be uh, dentists, dental hygienists, and dental therapists. They also participate in interprofessional uh, education activities, highlighting the opportunities for the medical and oral health improvement uh, opportunities. 
community-based outreach experiences also act as a pipeline for clinics across the state to hire our graduates. Many of our affiliate sites have alumni working at them now, acting as faculty and affiliate faculty supervising our students in outreach. In terms of faculty impact, many are volunteers uh, for the university. They are educating the next generation of dental professionals, but it also adds a new dimension uh, to what they think is, of course, their very meaningful work as a dentist. They deliver care with our students to diverse po patient populations, meeting critical dental needs. Without faculty, our students would not be afforded these community outreach experiences. So how do these outreach efforts enhance students' educational development? We asked our graduates, our alumni. Just two examples. Outreach has been the best experience thus far in my dental career. It was nice to learn new techniques and procedures while seeing a population that truly needs the work. I felt much appreciated at the outreach sites I visited, and I'm fortunate to have had this opportunity. Secondly, the uh, second quote, my education has benefited greatly by my outreach experiences in Wilmer and on the mobile dental clinic. I've seen more patients in one day than I often see in a week at the school. My confidence was increased, my skills sharpened, and most importantly, I saw how a dental therapist was meant to and could easily fit into a real clinic setting. Almost every student, including myself, wishes they could be on outreach all year round. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said earlier, these outreach experiences also provide opportunities for faculty members' uh, <laughs> research and scholarship. Uh, our associate dean for academics, Dr. Keith Mays, is specifically publishing uh, multiple papers, uh, creating new knowledge uh, from these student experiences. Our faculty also do uh, public engagement or research and scholarship in other ways uh, than just through the, the clinics that you see. Uh, for example, we have uh, faculty working with the Somalian community on research questions of interest to them. Uh, in closing, from our academic dean to tenure-track faculty to our master's level graduate students in dental hygiene, our research and scholarship involving community engagement is successfully competing for grant monies with the findings disseminated back to the communities that we serve and published in peer-reviewed journals. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Polacek. Thank you. Chair Omari, members of the board. This past summer, I had the opportunity to work with Assistant Vice Provost and uh, Research Fellow of Rajada Singh on a redevelopment master plan for downtown Thief River Falls. Uh, the economy in Thief River Falls is growing, but you wouldn't necessarily know it from the state of downtown. The, there is a number of vacancies in uh, the storefronts, including some of the beautiful big old buildings on the main drag. Uh, and people sort of scurry across the street to get to the other side um, so as to not get hit by cars, even when there are no cars on the block. <laughs> um, but there, um, So there's a sense of vacancy, but there is definitely um, energy within the community. So um, we had me meetings, uh, phone, phone, phone meetings weekly with members of the Chamber of Commerce, Downtown Development Association, and uh, other, other leaders from the business community on a weekly basis. Um, they helped us get a sense of the background, uh, history, current conditions, and their aspirations for downtown. They also hosted us three times over the summer to hold community meetings um, to better get acquainted with the community um, and hear the broader uh, aspirations for downtown. Um, people were really coming out of the woodwork to come to these meetings um, and were staying long after the meetings had ended. It felt like we were seeing the next generation of leaders coming to talk about what they wanted to see, to see downtown, um, the obstacles that they would um, face, and how to overcome them. Uh, so through the process, we developed five overarching principles that we felt the community should follow uh, in their future development. Those were very general, like connect with nature, design with scale, express culture, foster innovation and create experiences um, and we recommended ways that they could achieve these with very low uh, small investments like repainting the streets um, and angling parking to 
slow traffic, as well as large investments like creating a town square right at the middle of downtown. Um, but all the feedback was not positive. Uh, one meeting ended uh, with a sense of tension. Um, there was no consensus on how we should move forward. And one key stakeholder was really dragging his feet. Uh, he just wanted to get the streets plowed, um, which was fair enough. And some of the recommendations we were making were literally obstacles in plowing the streets. Um, so that one of the greatest takeaways I had from this experience was to get these people that are kind of dragging their feet or um, sat, to sit down and um, meet with them as early as possible because in fact he did have very real concerns um, and we were able to identify partners that could help us move forward, help him move forward um, and so we could all uh, achieve common goals. Um, and I couldn't have imagined a better in internship experience than uh, this one. I got to design and facilitate community engagement meetings draw images from what I was hearing from the community and then go right back and report to them and get their feedback once again. And I would like to thank the Northwest Minnesota Foundation, the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs, the Center for Sustainable Building Research, the College of Design, um, re the Regional Sustainable Par Development Partnerships, and uh, of course UMN Extension. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Polacek. Professor Linderman. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Omari and uh, members of the board. Uh, um, I'd like to share with you a few um, insights uh, of projects that I've worked on. Um, these projects uh, were in association with MINTAP, that stands for Minnesota Technical Assistance Program, and they're located on the third floor of this building. They're not uh, part of the uh, University of Minnesota, but they're supported by the state. And I worked on two projects with them. Um, the first project is that what they do is they help companies improve their environmental performance. So maybe a company is uh, wasting water and they want to figure out ways that they can change their processes around to reduce the water waste. Or maybe a company is emitting some pollutants and they want to figure out a way to reduce uh, uh, their emissions somehow. And how can they look at their business processes to kind of transform that. And so they come in and they support these companies with their technical assistance and help them make those changes to improve the environment. Now, one of the challenges is that a lot of these projects aren't that successful. They don't ultimately get implemented. And various factors come into play that um, reduce the likelihood of implementation. And so what our research did is we came in there and we studied these projects and we tried to identify what are the factors that drive successful implementation. And in our research, we discovered that um, the Minnesota Pollution and Control Agency had a big impact on the success of the projects. So the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency would come in and they would audit and assess these companies and if they found deviations in their environmental performance, they might provide a sanction or uh, maybe there'd be a financial penalty for doing that. And so what we found is if these the projects that MINTAP was working on uh, related to those uh, uh, penalties that uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency identified, then the likelihood of implementation is much higher. On the other hand, if uh, what uh, Min Minnesota Pollution Control Agency was doing was different, they found something different from the project that they were currently working on, the implementation success went way down. And so this study um, then became a basis for MINTAP and the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency start having a dialogue with one another about how they can better coordinate their efforts and increase the implementation of these environmental improvement projects. Um, I'd like to also mention that the, the projects over the summer would then engage uh, uh, University of Minnesota students in terms of internships and stuff like that, so it was part of their educational development also. So that's one project that we did with them. The other project is uh, something called Materials Online Waste Exchange. You can think of this as a Craigslist, if you will. Um, this is a, an exchange for Minnesota companies where they can put uh, products on this web exchange that other companies might want. And the purpose of this exchange is to help avoid landfill disposal. And so there's a lot of low-valued items that get disposed in landfill, and they'd like to ultimately repurpose or reuse these products as opposed to putting them in the landfill. 
And so one option is to put your, your product on the, on the, on the, on the, on the this, this exchange. And so it could be things like office furniture, a chair, something like that. Or it could be a construction company where at the end of the construction job they've got some leftover cement or wood. What should they do with that? Um, one option is to put it on this exchange and see if some other company could use that. Another option would be to dump it in the landfill. So the purpose of the exchange is to try to reduce the transaction cost and make it easier um, for companies to, to exchange these materials that they no longer need. And so we studied those, this web exchange and then we identified different factors which would uh, influence uh, you know, kind of how you design the web and then how you'd work with buyers and suppliers to promote exchanges. So we identified different factors related to that. I would just like to say also that um, this project engaged a PhD student um, and uh, it became the basis for the PhD student's research. And this student has now become a professor at Penn State University as an, and is continuing in this research. And he's re received a lot of recognition there. He's already won an early career professorship as part of this uh, project. And so one of the things I like about it is it ga engaged undergraduate students, engaged PhD students. It was engaged scholarships uh, for our research. And then we engage things like the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and various agencies around the state. And it was very exciting to work on this project. So I think this is maybe a nice example of trying to connect with the community. Thank you, Professor Linderman. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair Mari, members of the board. Thank you very much. And uh, we open up for discussion and questions. And I think this is a, an opportunity for us to think about some ways that uh, embedding our outreach work more fully into our research and teaching really is helping our students and our faculty in, in their success and impacting the, the state and beyond. Great. I think first I'll, I'll check in with the vice chair of this committee, Regent Simmons, and see if uh, you have any comments. And if not, then we'll go to the folks uh, in the room. Regent Simmons? Well, I do, and thank you, Chair Omari. Um, those presentations were really meaningful and important, and I, I appreciate all the work uh, the, uh, behind them. I um, have to say, I, I think our policy definition of outreach and public service is, is outstanding and should help guide us as a university, as a board, administration, faculty, in, in, in where our efforts go our time and our resources go, um, because this is one of our three core missions. I'd further like to say that the examples you provided us with today of public engagement um, contribute in ways that are hard to measure, but I think are real, to achieving um, other strategic objectives, including the one we had such a good conversation on this morning, and that is the, the diversity of our, of our student population. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Simmons, and I, I think that's a wonderful point in, in acknowledging and recognizing that a, a lot of our core mission uh, is very hard to measure, but that doesn't mean that it's not uh, impactful and important to the work that we do. Um, Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair Amari. Um, I love this kind of presentation. It fleshes out the reason why the university is so important to the state, and I wish that more people could uh, hear this kind of report. I have a question about the dentistry coverage. When I was in Crookston, I remember them um, people saying that there was no dental clinic in that county. And I'm just wondering how, what the state of coverage of dentistry is in the state of Minnesota and are there ways that we can impact by encouraging our students to um, practice out in the greater Minnesota? Are there ways that we can improve that because traveling to the next county is difficult? Professor Riggs. Yeah, Chair Omari and Regent Lucas, uh, you've really hit on, on a real need uh, across Minnesota, particularly uh, in outstate Minnesota. Um, one of the, the impacts of the experience of this course of going 10 weeks uh, out and about to the clinics is we are measuring and seeing that uh, our graduates are, because of that experience, are choosing uh, to practice across greater Minnesota. But the, the need is endless and there remains 
uh, counties uh, with very little dental access, particularly if uh, you are on public programs or Medicaid. As I said briefly, the reimbursement is so low uh, that it, it really hinders uh, access. And unfortunately, uh, often it's the people on public programs that have the greatest amount of disease. Mm -hmm. And so it's just uh, a, a terrible uh, situation. And uh, we do very intentionally work on providing experiences so our alumni feel equipped and go out to greater Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Regent McMillan. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Omari. Regent Lucas and I are thinking, and without communicating here, of the exactly the same issue. And I was going to, one, compliment uh, the dental school on the Hibbing Clinic, I think it was the first place President Kaler and I actually visited back in 2012 together when we were out touring things, and uh, it is a success. It's it's well regarded and very needed in, in uh, northeastern Minnesota. But bridging from delivering dental services to underserved populations, which is wonderful outreach work, to the question that Regent Lucas asked, which is placing dentists in underserved regions. You know, graduates of the uh, University Dental School feels like a, a big, big challenge, and you just you just said that, so I wanted to augur perhaps one level deeper into are there models at uh, medical and pharmacy where, where, where we seem to be having better success? I don't know what the metrics are for you, but I've got a, I got a folder full of letters from the mayor of Ely, you know, you can go on, and, and you said Crookston, doesn't matter where you are in outstate, there aren't enough practitioners. Duluth seems to have plenty, but outside of that in the Twin Cities, there aren't enough. So is there anything more we can do to take that wonderful outreach and turn it into what I think really hits a home run with leaders around rural Minnesota, and that is I got a University of Minnesota dentist that set up a shop in my town. Professor we, Riggs. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair Omari and Regent McMillan. <laughs> we feel very, uh, well served by uh, the government affairs staff uh, for the University of Minnesota. We feel that is, uh, it has to be kind of a policy solution uh, to really make a, a breakthrough. Um, while um, Medicaid doesn't pay highly to medicine or to pharmacy, it's still uh, better coverage and better reimbursement than it is for dental, so we, we work with government affairs. The other uh, piece of this that we're working hard on is loan forgiveness. We partner with Minnesota Dental Association, uh, the state of Minnesota, uh, to figure out ways uh, to for forgive loans in, uh, for a commitment of two, three, five years of service uh, in, in outreach uh, across rural Minnesota. So those are the we're open for all all other ideas, uh, uh, but those are kind of our, our two paths right now. Quick follow-up. Yes. Thank you, Chair Murray. So I was unaware that the fiscal policy issue is really driving that even more so than medical and pharmacy. So when I state something, I've now heard twice. Maybe I'll understand it. Um, Maybe, I don't know what we do next, it won't help the board to debate it, but creating a priority around that with our with our policy initiatives perhaps is where we need to go next. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair Omari. Um, as somebody who lives out in, in western Minnesota on the prairies or the tundra, whatever you want to call it, I, I, I like to tell people, I don't think the people that live in the seven county metro area understand how important we believe the University of Minnesota is and and how much we really want to engage our citizens and sometimes they don't get that chance um, I do want to thank I, I know the president and the provost have been good I, I I'm a real backer of our Minnesota Sparks program I know it's a lot of effort with the Alumni Association and the extension uh, but I think a steady diet of getting our professors out to these communities, engaging with people over the long haul will pay tremendous public relations dividends. And I, I understand it's not easy and it's expensive. I, I think back even, uh, my son was probably a, a sophomore in high school at Alexandria High School when 
we had a brass band come out from the university and they spent the day working with kids in the area and then did a concert in the community that evening and it, you know, it inspired my son to work harder to be something like that. Um, but I, I just don't think that the people who are here and have the value at every day understand how, it is, how important it is. And I also believe that um, those people can be our greatest advocates if we, you know, when we need them, if we just are, are, are cognizant of that. And, um, you know, so I, I don't know what else I want to say. I want to ask Mr. Palachik, I believe it was, did the Center for Small Towns help you out at all in, in what you were doing? You, are you aware of the Center for Small Towns from the University of Minnesota? Please. Um, Chair Omar, uh, maybe not. Jim Anderson, I, okay. I'm not. I, I think it spawned out of University of Minnesota Morris, and they're now, they're now in St. Cloud. But they go out every day and help small communities in Minnesota. I know how valuable they are. I, I ran into them in Crookston one day. Uh, they go out and help small communities do that. So I, I guess I don't have anything to say other than I want to tell you how important it is that we keep up that engagement because I think it'll pay dividends down the road. Thank you, Regent Anderson. And we're going to jump quickly, uh, given that we're coming close to an end of this agenda item, to Regent Powell and then Cohen, and then we'll bring it to a close. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair Amari. So um, I, I'll echo many of the things that have been said. It's, this is a, a, a terrific and very uh, informative uh, presentation, and it's great to see the impact that we're having through these through these programs. The dental case, I think, is particularly good um, because of the impact that it has on people receiving care, but also, I mean, the, the metrics are so good. You can really see uh, what you're doing and the impact that you uh, that you are having. I also wanted to echo um, a point that was made by, by one of you, which is, um, so having had some personal experience in this area, and I refer to this as sort of technical or expertise philanthropy, um, the impact on those who are providing the expertise is at least as good uh, as those who receive it. I think many people say this is some of the most inspiring work that they ever do, um, and it really cements um, and strengthens commitment to our institution. So I think it's I think it's terrific work. The questions that that, uh, that I have um, have to do with the economics of all of this and, and and how it's how it's governed. And I don't I didn't really see it in the presentation, but I think it would be really helpful for the Board of Regents to see how much we spend on this in totality, um, both uh, money from the university, money from grants, um, sources of funding. I'm interested in how much of the, of the uh, work is provided on a voluntary basis and how much is paid, because to the degree that it's voluntary, I mean, we, you know, you want to get credit for that, and, and, and I'd, I'd love to see that. And I think it's, I think it's important to then to understand of the 340 projects, uh, where do we focus? What are the primary? I, I, so I think some of these sort of ways to dimensionalize um, the work, the economics, what, what are the focus areas, and also uh, the governance of all this. It's a lot of programs, and I think I, I think it would be good to understand that there's a, a mechanism, whether it's using hard data or soft data for sunsetting programs if we don't feel that they're effective and we want to shift the resources, but some way I think it's important for us to know that um, we're we're governing this and we're curating it and um, things. Some, I mean, nothing lasts forever, and we've got limited resources, so we have to make sure that we're really putting them in the right place. So, applaud the program. I think it has tremendous impact uh, around the state. It's important for us to be doing this, but it would be good for the board to understand the economics uh, and the focus and the governance maybe a little better. Thank you. Please. Um, uh, Chair Amari, uh, Regent uh, Powell, thank you very much for those comments. And yes, we're, we're tackling uh, trying to get better metrics around this work. Uh, I would say that we've uh, initiated a number of strategies to try to capture some of these efforts in a way that can allow us to quantify some of the economics around it and also where there are potential gaps and where there are overlaps. So we've uh, identified these issuary networks where we've brought together individuals who are working around similar issues around food, for example, or transportation, to collaborate and, and get to know what each other is doing and catalog this work in a way that we can then say there's overlap in these areas potentially and, and to sunset some of the programs if, if needed. Um, we've also done that geographically in some areas as well. So we are making attempts. I would say that uh, one of the things that um, 
is is uh, of of um, importance is that this work is operationalized at the individual collegiate levels mm -hmm. and departmental levels and being able to uh, build spaces for uh, the colleges and departments to cross fertilize it becomes a key issue and that's another thing that we're working on. Okay, thank you. Uh, Regent Cohen. Thanks, Chair Omari. Um, over the years on the board, um, I've really seen great movement in intertwining the outreach, the public engagement with the other two parts of the mission of the university. So great compliments for that because I think it's really important that it's just an equal partner of our three-part mission. Uh, <clears throat> I'm wondering if you have a couple things that you're going to do differently or that the future holds that you could tell us about. Associate Vice President Farco. Uh, Chair Amari, uh, Regent Cohen, uh, one of the things that uh, we are always uh, mindful of is that the, um, the, the dynamics are changing around research and our funding agencies, our federal funding agents, uh, uh, National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health and others are requiring uh, more external partners in our grant proposals as well as uh, broader impacts, demonstration of broader impacts. That is uh, providing opportunities for us to work with the academic units to help our faculty and scholars think about the outreach mission more fully. And, um, and as was mentioned in the docket report, we've had an increase in the number of proposals that have been funded through uh, those kinds of mechanisms that have an outreach focus in, in the tune of um, over $500 million over the last four years. So the capacity of faculty and academic units to be able to do engaged scholarly work becomes key and important. And so our faculty development piece is something that we're working on to make sure our faculty have the capacity to do this work in, way, in ways that will be rewarded and they can advance as, as scholars. So that's an important issue. The other is um, some work we've been doing around um, assessing the impacts on our students around retention and promotion and, and uh, graduation. We do find that participation in community engaged work that's tied to academic work, specifically around service learning, uh, enhances students' academic outcomes in terms of persistence and retention. And that's true for both uh, uh, students from represented groups and non-underrepresented group. We have a four-year study underway currently with five other universities looking at this very issue funded by the U.S. Department of Education. So we are seeing very positive effects on students and we hope to be able to then cultivate uh, those opportunities more fully as, our, as one of our students uh, demonstrated today. Perfect. Thank you uh, to, to the presenters and colleagues. I apologize. I know that there are some who also wanted to weigh in, but it shows that the importance of this topic um, and that it is a con conversation that will continue. Thank you. Next, we will hear from uh, Vice President uh, Al Levine uh, our, on our annual report on the status of university research and commercialization of intellectual property. This is a discussion item noting that this typically comes uh, at a Friday board meeting, uh, but given that we have the structure of a full committee or all members on the committee, we are having it today. Provost Hansen. Uh, thank you, Chair Omari and members of the committee. Uh, th as, as the uh, committee chair noted, this is a key part of our mission, and so we're delighted to have uh, Vice President um, deliver the research report in this session. Good morning, <clears throat> good morning, Chair Omari and members of the committee. It's my true pleasure <clears throat> to present the annual State of Research Report on behalf of the Office of the Vice President for Research at the University of Minnesota. While our university researchers, of course, drive our discoveries and attract our resources, we trust that our office facilitates partnership with them in discovery and integrity across the entire research enterprise. I'll begin by reviewing some of the um, award funding data that we receive from our external sponsors. <clears throat> and I'll note that the award data come in one year but may represent one, two, three, five years of research dollars. They could help predict future expenditures but don't represent an annual amount necessarily. Um, the University of Minnesota faculty, staff, and students competed successfully for $745 million in externally sponsored research awards in 2017, which is down 5.5% um, from 2016. This $43 million drop followed sustained growth in the previous three years. As I shared in October with this committee, 
Some of this was due to delays and timing of some very large grants that impacted the totals, and we had fewer awards. Also to note that on the national scene, there are few to, fewer dollars available. We don't believe this represents a trend, or we at least hope it doesn't, because you'll see tomorrow that our first quarter data is amongst the highest we've seen before. Um, the next chart compares research award funding over 10 years within the Big Ten Academic Alliance. About half of our peers, you'll note, had decreased or flat award funding. Overall, within this elite group of universities, our university continued to rank third in new award funding as we have since 2013, and you can see that in the dark maroon line. Um, this next chart summarizes a 10-year distribution trend of research awards. Mm -hmm. The dark blue part of the bar is federal funding, as was the case last year. 60 cents of every dollar in our portfolio were from federal sources. Um, this year, the federal awards to the university were down 6%, NIH dipped 5%, NSF 15%, all other federal agencies were down some. And we also noted that our state awards fell to 2015 levels. The min drive money is not accounted for along with these awards. Um, while you can't see it very easily in this chart, we'll show you further that we're because of these decreased federal dollars and state dollars that are available, we're diversifying our portfolio into business and industry, B&I, and other private sources you see there. Pri other private is a catch-all category, including private philanthropy and collaborations with other universities where we were not the primary awardee. Um, this table that you see in front of you provides the values to the categories represented in the previous chart. Federal funding is down, as I previously stated. Um, in regard to future federal funding, we started out this calendar year with a proposal from our new administration that we were fearful was going to cause a decrease in total funding available to our, admin, to our um, faculty and students and staff. So our office took the role of doing more advocacy work during this year to talk about these future potential fund funding cuts. And also, in terms of looking at the diversification, as we talked about, you can see that business and industry, which is circled, continues to grow. It was up modestly this year by $3 million to $84 million, which is an 11% of all of our external wards. Um, you can see here that the last five years of BNI funding, where both the amount of the awards shown in gold and the number of BNI awards shown in maroon, have gone up substantially. We can tie these funding increases to several long-term public-private partnership strategies at the university, including MinDrive, the Minnesota In Innovation Partnerships known as MinIP, and the Corporate Engagement Workgroup, CEW. Um, we've laid out these strategies to help diversify our portfolio in light of predictable decreases in funding. Um, as one example, MinDrive supported researchers attracted $6.5 million in BNI funding in fiscal year 2017. And as we will see further on, the funding level of industry sponsored research projects using MinIP agreements continues to grow. Um, the increase in the number of awards in the BNI category seems to be largely due to an increase in the number of awards to the Academic Health Center, reflecting their prioritization of clinical trials. This next chart illustrates how the $745 million of externally sponsored research funding is distributed by college and campus. Um, after a few years of a downward trend, the medical school was up by $30 million, and we also noted significant increases in the School of Dentistry and the Humphrey School, which is shown as part of other category. And we also saw some very exciting projects outside the Twin Cities, including this one on the Duluth campus, which integrates into what you heard in the previous presentation about outreach and applied research. Um, the Center for Regional and Tribal Child Welfare Studies at UMD is addressing very important needs amongst the Native American families. They are leading a 2.8 million dollar five-year project funded by USDH uh, by the Health and Human Services to create a better delivery system for Indian Child Welfare Act, a law that aims to keep Native American families together. The study has many local and regional partners, including the courts, the child welfare agencies, the tribes, and to determine better methods to help children and families, again demonstrating how applied research can help out in the community. I'm now going to switch to research from research awards to research expenditures, which are most often used for comparison data in benchmarking universities, and also typically lag a year behind in their reporting. 
Um, this slide shows the top 15 public institutions. According to the National Science Foundation's HERD survey, which is the Higher Education Research and Develop, for 2016, our university maintained its rank of eighth among public research universities. You can see that circled. That's based on our research expenditures of $910 million. I'd like to note that if you include all our campuses, we're at $940 million, much of that additional research portfolio coming from UMD. Um, the University of Minnesota is about amongst the top 2% of colleges and universities reporting in the HERD survey. And there are two widely accepted and cited ranking systems shown on this slide as well, the Center for Measuring University Performance, and the Academic Ranking of World Universities, also known as the Shanghai Rankings, the U also continues to do well and has not lost ground to its peers there. And I am pleased to report that we have met our gold research metric for R&D expenditures set out by the Board and Administration, which is $900 million in research expenditures by 2021 on the Twin Cities campus, and we're at $910 million currently. And on all campuses, as I mentioned, 940. Um, the hard work to reach this goal is accomplished by our incredible faculty, staff, and students adapting to our ever-changing environments with new ideas and novel outcomes. Let's now move to the areas of technology commercialization and economic development. As we have done in previous years, we've included an expanded annual report um, for the technology commercialization, which you have handed out to you. And in this report, you'll see, along with other printed materials, how we're doing in that area. Nearly all metrics show growth in our technology commercialization. The MinIP Create program, which was launched in 2012, has brought in more than $2 million in licensing revenue and over $50 million in sponsored research funding. The sponsored research commitments under the MinIP program continue to grow in value year to year, reflecting the success of a joint effort by OTC and sponsored projects administration. A 2017 Milken Institute study ranked our Office for Technology Commercialization as fourth amongst U.S. tech transfer offices in executing license deals and sixth amongst U.S. public technology transfer offices overall. We had a record 18 startup companies launched in 2017 in a wide variety of sectors. By the end of 2017, 119 startups have been launched on technology developed at our university since 2006. Our startups represent a wide range of industries, and they've attracted $400 million in outside investments. Three out of the four startups are based in Minnesota, and 78% are still active today. The microbiome, with its implications for health and, and disease, is an area of great general interest these days. Each of us has just a few bacteria, 100 trillion bacteria and other microbes in us. Core Biome is a University of Minnesota startup that serves companies who are trying to tap into the new insights and excitement in this field. The founders have previously had their research supported by grants from NIH and NSF, and Core Biome combines expertise in genomics and in informatics to provide analysis of microbial communities for the agricultural sector, environmental, and human health applications. As you can see, they've attracted significant, significant capital and partnership. Our Office of University Economic Development was established to help business and industry partners connect with university resources, services, and expertise. They have served successfully as the front door and more for economic development at our university. And since 2014, UED has hosted 200 businesses and community partner visits to the university and made 231 on-site visits to business and community partners. Over one-fifth of these visits were to Greater Minnesota. UED over, oversees the Economic Development Fellows Consulting Program, which gets support and integrates with the graduate school as well. Last year, a committee UED and OVPR assembled, commissioned a report, Immigrants and Minnesota's Workforce. It found that the future strength of Minnesota's economy depends on attracting and integrating immigrants across into the workforce. UED and Minnesota Chamber of Commerce took this report on the road to nine Minnesota communities this past spring. As you've been informed, um, we have to reorganize UED due to budget constraints. 
We are now planning to integrate UED into a new larger office that includes our current technology commercialization and our venture center functions. UED's front roll door will remain intact, but we'll need to adjust our efforts to reduce resources and accomplish what is most critical for the university and the state in economic development beginning in 2019. After January 1st, we'll be communicating more details about the future structure for economic development services, as well as undertaking a renewed look at the economic development as part of our work on the system-wide strategic planning effort. So let me turn now to some of the programs, mostly in OVPR, that are helping to facilitate our research enterprise. As you can see, MinDrive, a partnership between the university and the state of Minnesota that aligns areas of our strength with the state's key and emerging industries, has done very well. The original four MinDrive research areas included robotics, sensors, advanced manufacturing, global food ventures, advancing industry, conserving our environment, and discoveries and treatments for brain conditions. The state invested nearly $18 million annually in us, and in return, 677 people have been hired, including 31 new faculty, 980 researchers have been involved, and there's been more than 100 departments and on three campuses with work going on, and 60 MinDrive supported trainees are now employed with groups such as Boston Scientific, Ecolab, Sundial, REG Life Sciences, and others. So let's take a look at the leveraging of this. Our researchers attracted $25 million in funding from external sources such as NSF, DuPont, Alina Health, and Excel from January to June of 2017. They had 28 inventions that were disclosed during that period, and in its 2017 session, we believe the Minnesota legislature saw the strength of this program and passed additional funding $4 million per year for a MinDrive cancer initiative, which will focus on creating a network of statewide multi-site cancer clinical trials. In my view and others, this program remains a good template for us to collaborate with the state and find other resources as well. Our scientists and physicians doing neuromodulation research as part of the MinDrive program were able to leverage the youth's strengths in this area along with state support to help attract a major federal grant. The U of M was designated a Udall Center for Excellence for Parkinson's Disease Research, one of eight such centers in the US. The center will receive $9 million over the next five years from NIH's National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. We'll explore developing new treatments for Parkinson's disease using what's known as DBS or deep brain stimulation. This week, we also had exciting news that Boston Scientific received FDA approval for a new deep brain stimulation system for Parkinson's patients. The university played an important role in the development of this in the FDA approval with a phase three clinical trial site here led by our MinDrive supported researchers. And our medical center will be the site for the first commercial implant in the US today. Our office also has been working in partnership with those related to the Twin Cities Grand Challenges research agenda, which is led by our provost. You saw some of the partnerships when we brought the Institute on the Environment, the Institute for Advanced Study here along in October. Our office has been actively involved in this, and um, the Institute of the Environment, which is, reports to us, has been a significant funder of some of the work in the Grand Challenges program as well. And the provost will be detailing this work when she presents to you tomorrow. I trust. <laughs> um, over the past five years, our office has provided $25 million with $34 million with matching funds included to researchers. We have such programs as grant and aid, which are small grants that return seven times our investment in terms of external funding. We have our grant match programs that secures important grants that require an institutional match. We have our larger Minnesota Futures grant, which we brought an investigator who did work related to bee nests here last October. And we have our research infrastructure investment program that helps ensure the university maintains a robust state-of-the-art equipment structure. And we get significant matches of two to one, from often from colleges and departments for that. The importance of research funding cannot always be measured in how it's leveraged, but leverage is an important lens for us to evaluate our work, one that we will explore more in the creation of the U's system-wide strategic plan. 
Research computing has been a success at providing informatics capabilities across a broad swath of the University of Minnesota research. This computing centers, this, these centers are an umbrella consolidating management and research computing services from MSI, the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute, Informatics, the University of Minnesota Informatics Institute, and Use Spatial. These three units offer standardized and customized resources for compute and data intensive research to the University of Minnesota research community. And they serve a great many researchers. MSI alone serves 800 research groups and over 4,500 users. Research computing accelerates research at our university and allows researchers access to cutting edge tools without their having to develop an expertise in computing, which may be quite tangential to their own field of study. And one example, I had received a call asking for some startup funds for a new psychology professor and what we were able to do is give them access to the MSI network in order for them to do their work and we didn't have to use direct dollars but we used the in-kind dollars through the MSI network. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, one of the important areas of work for OVPR is overseeing the integrity of research at our university, one, an area that every university is being examined carefully in. Following a rigorous review and assessment of our human research policies and practices in 200, 2015, the university implemented major changes to enhance its human research protection program. The initiative completed its implementation phase in December of 2016, having put in place more than four dozen recommendations from the review, as well as many other enhancements. We've provided this information on a regular basis to the audit committee, and it's a heavy lift doing this, but we think of this as continuing improvement. It doesn't end here. The upshot is we have much more capacity and capability with human participants in much more detailed ways to ensure compliance with our standards as well as federal and state standards. Last December, our Human Research Protection Program was reaccredited, and we received special distinction by the Association for the Accreditation of Human Research Protection Programs, which you can read more about in your docket. Now I would like to quickly overview some of the planning and prioritization work that our office is part of. We are continuing to make progress on our research strategic plan. In your docket you will have some three-year highlights and progress summary of key research initiatives and programs. Under the system-wide strategic plan the board has requested and I am responsible for four priority areas under research and discovery. First to review internal research and entrepreneurial support funding then to look at research talent recruitment and retention practices, to review our technology commercialization and economic development efforts, and to review the role of interdisciplinary research centers, institutes, and infrastructure in terms of the core research services that we provide at this university. I've tasked leaders in our unit and elsewhere to, to, for these reviews, and we've met with the chancellors yesterday and we'll continue discussing this and how we work together on a system-wide strategic plan in this area. I know I've gone through a lot of data and quickly, um, I want to summarize by saying our office has supported our faculty, staff, and students who have maintained our rank of eighth among public research universities in research expenditures. Our business and industry funding, both in the dollar amount and the number of awards, has risen steadily, and we've seen a bump in research clinical trials. These represent the successful strategies the university has implemented and the priorities it has set to grow industry partnerships. In our planning, we need to look carefully and pay attention to where more than two-thirds of U.S. research and development resources are today, that is, in business and industry. We continue to have tech transfer successes with some impressive new rankings from the Milken Institute as an increased in sponsored research commitments and our growing startup community which is attracting significant investment capital. And in MinDrive, our investment in research on the brain and neuromodulation helps set us the foundation for a major new center and area of work in Parkinson's disease. Minnesota's political leaders recognize the success of this effort, as I said, by increasing and including new clinical trials funding. Advoc we're also advocating the benefits and importance of university research. It's a continuing to be an important role for all of higher education. We're called an R1 university for a reason. We need to continue to make this case with our public to, and through our applied research and stories that we tell, we can do so. 
Um, the university, including those of us in OVPR, have stepped up our advocacy for research funding for federal government, addressing issues such as indirect costs and fair tax treatment of graduate students. We need your help as regents, as representatives of the people of Minnesota, to remind our members of Congress and the state legislature of the importance of research at our university. The University of Minnesota has many assets in its people, in its infrastructures. If we can continue to make the case for public investment, it can continue to be competitive for those resources and continue to refine and follow strategies to diversify our funding base. We can be a leader in adapting the new research reality. Thanks so much, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, Vice President Levine. Um, I, I want to, one, uh, thank the staff that are here as well who work uh, in, in the office and around the institution. Uh, I think this presentation really highlights the vastness um, and interconnectedness of, of the research that's happening. So if you did that when I ran to the restroom, Another thank you to all you. All. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to first turn to Regent Beeson uh, for questions and comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, presenters. Vice President Levine, this is this maybe your fourth or fifth leadership job at the university? <laughs> I'm trying them out, seeing which one works best. Uh, we love your energy and your, your capability and yeah, your, your career. Um, here, I might suggest that as you look at your work plan, and it, maybe it's implicit, um, but that uh, you're able to spend as much time as you can working with Dr. Toller and with the medical school. Uh, I want to make a point about uh, if you'd go back to the slide at the top 15 institutions and uh, ask staff to provide. Staff to maybe provide us with the ranking of their each of our competitors' medical school. We know we're ranked 35th. We know, I believe, that that's largely built around research that comes out of the medical school. But if we were able to generate another 50 million or 75 million out of our medical school and elevate that to where we, we think it is, you could see how we could defend our ranking at eighth and maybe move up a notch or two. So this is, re I'm not saying anything people don't know, but I'm making the, the point that uh, that's sort of the underdeveloped uh, piece that we have, and that's why we're spending, that's why we need resources out of our partnership with Fairview, that's why Dr. Jackson and now Dr. Toller and the President, everybody's spending so much time around this, it's being able to hire researchers in the medical school that can produce, uh, that can uh, produce uh, that revenue. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Uh, did you want to comment? I'm just Chair Amari, Regent Beeson, and others. Yeah, I, I meet regularly with Dr. Tolar, and we've discussed these issues. We've also been looking at data from other universities to see how many more physicians and clinicians they have in place to make these dollars work. So we have to look at a per capita basis to see how we're doing there as well. Thank you. Uh, Regent Powell. Well, thank you, Chair Amari. Uh, and um, thank you, uh, Professor Levine, for that review, which was fast. Uh, but very thorough. <laughs> and uh, and um, so a couple of, of comments and, and maybe a question. Um, I noted when you talked about the trend in um, BNI funding, uh, you were very, which is a very nice, it's a really nice trend, and you were very specific about uh, the strategies uh, employed to drive that. Um, one of them is MinDrive. Corporate engagement was the second one, and the third one flew by. Uh, but I know there were three. Um, and, and you were very kind of specific about how that has, has driven performance. And so the, so, so the, the question I have is when you, th and, and you were also, um, uh, I thought, optimistic about the larger trend for research growth in the university, even with the dip this year. I mean, I sensed you know, a positive feeling there. And so I'm wondering if you can comment on the core strategies that have driven sort of the larger momentum in research um, dollar success at, at the university. I know that there are many, 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 because the funding comes from lots of sources, but you seem optimistic about continued Im improvement. So if you comment on the core strategies. And then the, and then the last question is to your comments on our uh, success in the bio and pharma and med tech area, and you highlighted um, some recent um, you know, good work that we've done there. And I also noted in the report that almost half of the startups over the last you know, period of time, almost half are in, in med tech and, and pharma. So that's a, and then we, and we just know that that's, that's a huge industry area for our region. I mean, we really are the global center 
for medical technology. And so the question on that is, you know, for all the good progress that we've made, isn't, isn't there a lot more that we could go for uh, as, a, as a center of, of, of research in, in the med tech area? It seems like, you know, a goal that said we really want to be the preeminent global partner and center for this kind of research, given the corporate infrastructure that surrounds us, that that would be uh, something worth considering. So those are, the, those are the questions. Thank you for the very good presentation. Gerald Murray, Regent Powell, and members, yeah, you've asked a whole series of questions. One of the key things that a university has to do is be agile. And it's not easy to do that. Um, our, our investigators are really private entrepreneurs in many ways. And we have much more interdisciplinary work now than we had historically. Um, we're trying to engage that. So one of the things our office needs to do more of is to engage groups of faculty together, and the provost office does this as well through the new cha um, grand challenge grants, to engage faculty across disciplines and be ready when new proposals come out to be able to move quickly. And we're working with a private agency as well and with government relations in terms of finding out in advance when these large grants are available so that we can have a team of people ready to move quickly. Because many times these grants are assembled through their project officers at the federal agencies. And if you're part of that gang, you find out about it. Which we have a number of members of our faculty that are in fact connected, well connected. But that's one thing. As far as the community um, of business industry, it takes a lot of effort and with the medical industry as well, to be very careful in how you engage, right? So you don't look as though you're being purchased by an agency and mm -hmm. then doing research on their behalf. Mm -hmm. So it has to be, you, while you want to follow the money and chase the money at some degree, you have to follow your integrity and your research and really find the areas that are a win-win for different industries. And we have done that with a number of major industries with master agreements and MinIP kind of work that we've done. Um, because these industries as a whole gain from us and we gain from them. So that's the, that's the attention you have to play to those things. I think you're right. There's a lot more we can do. There's only so much time in the day for our faculty, but we will try to help to the best of our ability on this as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Omari. Uh, perhaps building on Regent Powell's question and thinking about uh, applied versus basic research, or better said, applied and basic research. I hope that uh, you and President Kaler are looking and thinking at uh, are we optimally organized from an org chart standpoint and a resource standpoint to bring those elements of our research enterprise together to do the kind of interdisciplinary work you were just talking about. And it feels like over my time on the board, you know, the basic is a big, big number, applied is a much smaller number, but when we talk about value in the outreach space, applied gets a lot of attention when we have successes or even, you know, when we're just working in an area, as we just heard from uh, that, the, the prior presenters. So could you give me any sense as you look out over the horizon, is, is funding for applied research on the grow? Is it growing relative to basic? And then in a related sense, are we optimally organized? And I'm not looking for an org chart answer right now, but are there things you're thinking about that might better align those so that we're hitting home runs when we're at the plate? Great points, uh, Regent McMillan. Please, Vice President Levine. Chair Omari, Regent McMillan, and members of the committee. Um, those are important points, and one thing I'll point out is the federal agencies are aware of this because the public is demanding it. Mm -hmm. And so when you write a grant in a federal agency now, if it's a, even if it's in basic science, you have to put in there how this is going to come for an application. What is the reason you're doing this research? If you're chasing a signal transduction pathway, is it going to help in cancer research? Is it going to come up with some kind of a solution? And we see more and more of that kind of um, issue that comes forward in terms of that. And along with the provost's office and with Dean Tolar and the Academic Health Center, we need to have these discussions as far as how we make these applied. The other thing I'll mention quickly is with the advent of more commercialization and our Office of Commercialization, those are incentives for faculty to find applications. In the field of microbiome, I don't think historically, because I did some research in this area, that microbiology of the gut, for example, was seen as something we were going to have fecal transplants for and have an entire company that might be around creating fecal transplants. So that incentivizes investigators to go down the pathway of more applied research. 
President Kaler, you want to comment? Sure. Just a footnote to that. Uh, as you know, uh, Professor Tolar is the interim uh, leader of the Academic Health Center, and this provides an opportunity uh, for us to investigate deeply the alignment of the Academic Health Center and its overall mission. Uh, one of the missions is to promote uh, research amongst the so-called health sciences colleges. Uh, that was a good thing 20 years ago. Now pretty much every one of our colleges is a health science college one way or another. So as we look at the reorganization and re reframing and repurposing of the AHC, uh, this issue around proper organization and lowering barriers uh, is an important thing in front of us. Great. Thank you. We're going to go to Regent Shu and then Regent Anderson is going to bring us home. Uh, thank you, Chair Omari. Uh, Vice President Levine, could you go to page 15, please, on your presentation? Slide 15 or? Uh, slide. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. This is the one. No, this is not the one. Um, go to, it shows up as 15 on mine. It's the slide with the um, rankings. Thank you. Um, so there's a lot going on in this page. Um, yes. And, but I have a couple questions. So there's a little uh, superscript or something um, behind UC San Francisco and also Texas MD um, Anderson Cancer Center. Can you explain kind of what those are, if they mean anything, or we should kind of... Okay. I'm being taught. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> Re <laughs> Regent Omar, <laughs> Chair Omari, is Regent. The man it's in the docket, apparently, and we can provide the details. It was how it was expressed, mostly because they're medical institutions. So, those are not undergraduate campuses. Those are not undergraduate campuses. Thank you very much. <laughs> you never know who's going to have the answer in this group. Good answer. Um, <laughs> follow up, please. Yeah. So um, I was just a little bit curious because MD Anderson obviously is, um, you know, medical, medically oriented. They've got $852 million um, versus our medical school, which on a previous slide I think it was in the $211 million range. And I'm just kind of wondering if we should be taking anything away from this, the magnitude and the differential of those numbers. Vice President yes. Levine. Chair Omari. Regent Chu, members, um, you know, the, the numbers of faculty who are doing research in each of these medical schools, that's why I was saying on a per capita basis, at some level, it, the comparisons might not be fair in that way. And the, the take home message might be, we, those institutions have chosen to invest more in, in those areas that get NIH and NSF funding from that, from the faculty they hire. Also, you have to separate the clinical programs from that as well. So, and the herd data are not just medical schools, obviously. For example, we, um, I think the number was, we're like 23rd in NIH grants if you include the School of Public Health as well. So we don't want to look just at the medical school when we're looking at some of these data, because they include other parts of our university that are also involved in health sciences. Okay, Thank one, you. One more follow-up, please. Thank you, Chair Omari. Um, the last question is just, uh, you know, Wisconsin just keeps on beating us. Um, <laughs> and I'm wondering, are we making up any ground because of their funding problems and other issues that they're having on, um, in their system? I mean, are we, do we, have, I mean, it like, looks like they're about 200 and some million dollars ahead of us, but is there any plan in place to overtake them? Right Chair right. Omari, Regent Chu. Well, we, we occasionally go down there and visit and try to see what's going on. <laughs> now, seriously, um, they've done very well over the years in some of these areas. And part of it is they have a tremendous amount of funding in an area um, in their foundation funding from the old warfarin studies. So that contributes to some of the success in hiring and funding dollars as well. But I don't have the answer to know exactly why the difference is there. You can see that they're not pulling away like Michigan is. Michigan is really pulling away on that. And Regent Anderson for the last comment. Thank, Thank you, Chair Omari. I'll, I'll be very brief, but uh, this is really important stuff to me. I, I, I enjoy this stuff. I enjoy being a person who's been in the business world, and I love the, the technology and commercialization idea of we start with an idea and we spin it out into a business which provides jobs to Minnesotans. I mean, great jobs. I think 
I agree with Regent Powell. I'd like to see our aspirations be really, really big in this area. Uh, I, I, you, you mentioned deep brain stimulation, and I remember a presentation I saw not long ago. Uh, that is a that is a um, process of our medical community and our engineering community coming together collegially to do that. And the presentation I saw, this group of professors and stuff were getting ready to commercialize that, hopefully. Um, and, I, and I think back to, you know, we're probably the, the starting point of that when, when we had medical people and electricians invent the pacemaker back in the 50s. So Minnesota has a long, long history of the collegial interdisciplinary things, and I think it should be aspirational for us to get better. That's my only point. I don't need a comment. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Regent Anderson. Thank you, Vice President Levine, and to the friends who we phoned in for that. Um, very great presentation. Next up, um, we will continue our conversation about system-wide enrollment planning. This is a discussion item uh, in our newly inaugurated uh, Chancellor of the Morris Campus, Chancellor Baer, will join us for the conversation. Welcome. Thank you. The floor is yours. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Chair Omari and, and members of the committee. I'm really pleased to be here today to share with you uh, some perspectives on Morris's enrollment planning, both the work that's taking place in Morris and within the context of the larger strategic framework and the enrollment management work plan. But I think it's helpful in keeping with our focus on system-mindedness as outlined in the framework um, to call out two ways in which Morris really has a distinctive role within the University of Minnesota system. And the first is that Morris serves as kind of a public-private, uh, it provides students in Minnesota and beyond with access to a high quality and rigorous liberal arts college experience. And these are the kinds of uh, exclusively undergraduate, residential, high-touch uh, institutions of higher education that provide undergraduate students with experiences that undergraduates are not always able to access at other uh, more comprehensive institutions. So our students are mentored by faculty and staff. They publish and present professional papers with their faculty mentors. They have extraordinary leadership opportunities as an integral part of our campus governance system. In short, they have a really rich and high quality education. The second uh, distinctive thing I think about the Morris campus is its historic mission to serve talented underserved populations in the state of Minnesota and you can see by the uh, figures on this slide that today um, we are the most ethnically diverse of all of the University of Minnesota campuses including a student population that's approximately 20 percent American Indian and a student population of which about 40 percent are first generation college goers. So as I talk about enrollment trends and our plans with respect to enrollment, I want to note part of the larger context of things that are going on on the Morris campus. After the uh, adoption of the strategic planning framework in June by the board, um, and because I am a new chancellor, uh, we have been launching a comprehensive strategic visioning and planning process on the Morris campus. We began this fall with a series of community conversations in which students, staff, and faculty participated to discuss some of the larger context around which we operate today in higher education, kind of a level set to put Morris in the bigger conversation. So as we then this next semester begin to really think about what Morris 
want to be and do 10 years from now, that is, what do we aspire to think about our campus as a liberal arts institution in the 21st century, we have a broader context in which to have that conversation. So that conversation will be going on this spring, and then in the fall we will take our vision about liberal arts in the 21st century at Morris and develop a series of strategies and tactics. So that larger conversation is going on even while we, as you'll see in a minute, are addressing issues around enrollment. So the next set of slides provide you with some uh, historic and, and current information about enrollments at Morris. So as you can see from this slide, which shows enrollments from 2000 to the present, our student population size has fluctuated over the last 20 or so years. And one of the things that we need to do as a campus uh, moving forward is uh, to develop a strategy to try to even out these peaks and valleys. And so that's, that will be part of our conversation in the strategic visioning and planning. What's the right size and how do we think we get there? Because obviously if you're building budgets based on um, student enrollment that goes up and down, that's a, a difficult conversation to have. So we're working on that. This next slide hones in on our enrollment in a slightly um, more close-up view, looking at the last 10 years. And I would like to point out here that about three quarters of our enrollment every year, our new enrollment every year, comes from the first year class, and about a quarter of it comes from transfer students. Um, as the numbers have fluctuated over time, however, you can see that at least by one measure of academic quality, we have remained very constant over time. So the Morris campus originated from the imagination and hard work of, of the uh, business and, and civic leaders of Morris who thought it would be really important to have a University of Minnesota campus to serve the West Central Minnesota region. But you can see from this slide that our student population, our current student population, is drawn from the entire state of Minnesota and beyond the state of Minnesota. At the present, more than 80% of our domestic students are from the state of Minnesota, and almost a third of them are from the metro area. Fewer than 10% are from Stevens County, where Morris is located, and the surrounding counties. And there are a number of reasons why that is, uh, in part because there are fewer students, um, but also because in some ways as the uh, Twin Cities campus has tried to um, encourage more students from greater Minnesota to attend the Twin Cities campus, that has directly affected us as well. This is just a, a, a graphic depiction of our entering class this fall, um, which shows, I think, really clearly the fact that we uh, draw a lot of our student body from the metropolitan area and from pretty much every county in Minnesota. One of the historical strengths of Morris, as I mentioned before, and a, and a goal from our previous strategic plan, which was adopted in 2007, has been to continue to diversify our student body. And of course, there are, as was pointed out earlier, many different kinds of measures of diversity. But one measure of this is the um, racial and ethnic diversity of our students, which has increased substantially, as you can see, over the last 10 years. One of the, um, while we are very committed to, to diversifying our student body and very proud of the f success that our American Indian students have had uh, at Morris, one of our challenges continues to be how we um, deal with the American Indian tuition waiver, which provides uh, for our American Indian students to attend the Morris campus tuition free. So given this context, Let's talk a little bit from a, from a high view of what we're doing to bolster enrollment at Morris. This is a selective list. It's not a, a comprehensive list. 
And there are on this list some actions that we hope will pay off for next fall's class. For example, we are sending out financial aid award notifications earlier this year, and in fact, the earliest among the, the five campuses of the system. And we have redesigned significantly some aspects of our communication and visitation for potential students. So those are sort of things we hope will have short-term effects. But there are also some things that we're doing that we anticipate will take a little longer to come to fruition, including creating articulation agreements with community colleges and the creation of new student pipelines, including um, a deeper engagement with the uh, Latinx populations in Morris and in Wilmer and in our general region. The other side, of course, of enrollment is also student retention. And again, you can see that the picture has been of some um, inconsistencies, I guess I would say, over time. Um, and so this is another area of focus for us. Here we have work to do to decrease the, the churn and to increase the overall rate. Now I will say that in terms of uh, looking at our institutional peer group and our um, fellow members of the Council of Public Liberal Arts Colleges, we think we compare reasonably favorably, but that's not good enough and it's not good enough relative to um, the standard we expect at the University of Minnesota. So toward that end, we have an, a number of things going on on campus right now to try to um, take a look at our retention and, and um, improve it. One of the things that um, I noticed when I came on campus is that we've done a lot of work, we've secured a lot of grants, we've had a lot of um, initiatives around trying to in, enhance first year student retention. In fact, there are over 20 such initiatives on campus. Um, we have not always done a good job at coordinating those or at understanding how effective they might be or might not be or what is being um, duplicative and where are there gaps and opportunities. So we are, uh, we've put together a task force to take a look at all of the things that we're doing and to try to develop some metrics and figure out what kinds of data we would need in order to analyze these things in order to understand where our opportunities are with respect to um, our current suite of practices. Another area of focus for us has been on uh, fostering student mental health and wellness. We know from talking to students who left Morris last year that fully a quarter of them cited some issue around mental health as a reason for why they were choosing to leave our campus. And so last year as part of our budget compact, the system was very generous in providing us some resources around working toward um, more comprehensively uh, integrating um, mental health and well-being into the student experience and in collaborating with other system campuses around improving service in our rural area. And then the third area of focus that we believe will be impactful is around what we call high impact practices. These are things like internships, capstone courses, community engaged courses, uh, meaningful work opportunities. At Morris, part of what we do, part of the Morris experience, is integrating these high impact practices really well into third and fourth year student experiences. So our students get very rich opportunities to work with faculty, to do internships and so forth. But as we look at our NESI data and other kinds of survey data, first year students have not been well engaged in these first year practices. And we believe that if we can uh, make these opportunities more broadly available to first year students, that will be helpful in helping them to feel a part of the Morris community. So we're going to be working over the next uh, year and a half, two years on these issues and we hope that they will result in uh, an increase, a sustainable increase in tuition, uh, sorry, in retention rates. Intuition. Yeah, I know, that was good. <laughs> okay, so, th so those are the things that we're doing right now on the Morris campus um, and I'd like to turn our attention now to um, thinking about what 
we're doing at Morris with respect to the system and the system-wide strategic framework. And, and I call out um, this market and rebrand around fit and campus distinctiveness phrase that's from the framework, because I think that's really key for our future um, in thinking about how we elevate each of the campuses within the system so that we um, don't cut the pie up, but rather we grow the pie. So we are really committed uh, at Morris to working with the other campuses in thinking about the, um, the enrollment management work plan and thinking about the strategic plan. And one of the things that I'm not going to talk about in any detail, but one of the things that we are interested in is thinking about um, formalizing some of the pathways and pipelines that we have uh, to graduate programs and professional programs at um, the Twin Cities campus and the Duluth campus. We know anecdotally that our students are sought after, that I, I hear all the time from faculty that Morris students are great as graduate students. They get a really great grounding, but we don't always take full advantage of some of the opportunities to, to formalize those relationships. So I'm going to focus here on the first three recommendations that emerged from the uh, system enrollment management work plan. These are the three um, areas of recommendation that Provost Hansen has asked us to, to focus on first that, that are the highest priority. So it makes sense to talk about them in the, um, in the short term. So, Again, one of the things we need to do is to think about what the right size is at Morris and how we can develop realistic goals and targets to um, make sure that we are consistent with respect to our patterns of enrollment. And also to think about ways in terms of how we operate that we can work more closely with the resources available to us through the system um, in terms of making budget decisions and thinking about how we operate. The second uh, recommendation has uh, to do with um, understanding the system undergraduate enrollment as a whole and on each of the five campuses. And toward that end, uh, you saw in an earlier slide, we're taking a look at our financial aid deployment and making sure that that makes sense in the current environment. We're thinking about um, how we can strategically uh, respond to changes in student demographics as they are taking place, both in our local region and more broadly. And one of the things that um, you saw, I believe it was in the September presentation to the board about um, enrollment management, was the, um, the fact that, for the, that there's considerable overlap in terms of applications among the various campuses. For the Twin Cities campus, some very minute portion of their um, applicant pool is also applied to Morris, but for us it's about half of our applicants also apply to the Twin Cities. So there's some, um, not urban legend, but maybe rural legend around how impactful and how much competition there might be between the campuses, but we don't really have any good data about that. And so it would be helpful for us to, to take a look at that and to see where, where we're competing and how we're competing and how we can help each other rather than to compete against one another. And the third thing is uh, to, again, elevate, lift up the distinctive differences of each of the system campuses in terms of how we communicate as a system um, and to help uh, students, potential students and uh, residents of Minnesota understand that we are five uh, institutions that have, yes, absolutely some similarities, but we also offer different kinds of opportunities to undergraduate students. And it may not be a good fit at one of our campuses, but it might be a great fit at another campus. And so we're very anxious to work with university relations and communications offices around thinking about how we can message that um, and, and again, to, to lift all of our boats. So I want to end as I um, 
stand for questions or sit for questions. Um, with just some good news about Morris over the last year, these are all things that um, that we can be proud of as, as um, the Morris campus is a great exemplar of the quality of things that are taking place on the in the University of Minnesota. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chancellor Baer. And I open it up to the floor for uh, questions and comments. We'll go to Regent Johnson and then Regent Powell. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Chancellor, for your comments and your uh, good work out at uh, Morris. As you know, I, I live within the hour of Morris, and there are students from uh, Wilmer and West Central Minnesota that attend Morris. I know a number of people in the business community and farming community in the Morris area. What I'm getting at, there seems to be a disconnect in the local community and appreciation for the University of Minnesota Morris within their community. And I hear it from time to time, and I'm just wondering, you're the new person and a new start. Do you ever think about, and maybe you already do, having a connection with the Morris Chamber of Commerce yep. or inviting mm -hmm. the ag community to campus? Because when I see, I think it was 8% of your students come from Stevens County, uh, seems that could be uh, you know, so, somewhat higher. I'm talking about this disconnect. I don't think that Morris and Stevens County appreciate fully the University of Minnesota being in their community. And I'm probably being a little blunt here and uh, probably get some feedback, but that's, that's fine. But I'm trying to, because you know, you look at our other campuses, Duluth, when I hear Regent McMillan talk about Duluth, Duluth and UMD, it's all in the same sentence. You know, and you talk about Crookston, I've been there, and that community, and Rochester, and so on and so forth. I don't always hear that at Morris. It's not your fault. I don't think it's anybody's fault. It's just the way it is. And I'm trying to figure out a better connection and a networking, because I think the result would be more students and uh, enrollment, so on and so forth, if you'd care to comment. Chancellor Baer. Uh, thank you, Chair Omari and, and Regent Johnson. Uh, yeah, I think sometimes there is a little um, difference between town gown. So one of the things that I've been doing since I've arrived in Morris has been try, trying to connect with the local community. And, and we've talked um, about having some um, events on campus in which we would open the campus and invite the community to come in. Uh, I have uh, talked to the chamber of, folks at the Chamber of Commerce Board. I have visited local businesses and um, you know, talked with whoever, whoever might be willing to listen, got, gone to community events and so forth. So that's a, that's a work in progress. Um, I, I do think that um, some of the leakage maybe in terms of student enrollment might be because uh, we're, we're in a time where communication is global and instant and people know about the big city and there's some allure for rural kids to travel to the big city and, and maybe um, they might be less excited about staying home in their own backyard. That's just a, a, a guess. But we're working, we're working on developing relationships with various members of the local community. Regent Powell. No, I didn't. No, oh, all right. Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chancellor Baer, uh, for the for the uh, presentation. The um, talked earlier about uh, trying some non-traditional uh, recruitment efforts, and, and um, the demographics aren't going to make this any easier going forward. They're, they're just not. So I think what we've done before um, is not going to be enough, and I'm not suggesting replacing the good works that are going on and how, how we're uh, recruiting for the system campuses, but it, we really need to be bold about how, how, we, uh, how we reach the kids, because there is a story, there's, value, there's a value proposition that's really strong, it's unique, and it's part of our system. All the things we know to be true, it just, it's how we communicate uh, all that. I also, and I'm not in the audit committee, but I hope some of my colleagues who are will ask uh, Vice Provost McMaster, the audit report had a 
had a section here about the the, uh, the I'll quote it. There was a conscious decision by the Twin Cities as they feel their primary goal is to recruit for the Twin City campus. This has to do with the common U of M's common app. And I thought we had made enough progress so that we could make this easier for students who to, you know, they're all going to go to the Twin Cities page first. And if they don't see the common app on the Twin Cities application page, then, you know, they might not find it. So I hope I want to push the administration a little bit to relook at this because that we don't need to use the word leakage. Leakage out of our system right. is really unacceptable. And so I don't know if you have opinions about it or we can, again, ask the provost when he's Vice you, uh, thank you for bringing that up, Regent Beeson. I know that's been a, a conversation that's been happening for a few years now about how we can create better synergies between the admissions uh, uh, offices on the system campuses. Do you want to comment on, on that, Chancellor Bear? Yeah, I, I, I guess, yes, thank you, um, Chair Omari and Regent Beeson. Um, I, I, I do think some of this is around um, communicating and messaging and, again, lifting up the fact that when you say University of Minnesota, you don't just mean this campus. Um, I've talked, I've met with a lot of students, had lunch with them, and I always ask, well, how did you end up at Morris? And sometimes the answer I get is, well, it was a mistake. I thought I was, <laughs> right? I got off the airplane, especially international students, I got off the airplane and then I found out it was another three hours. Um, so, so I think some of it is lack of awareness, and, and again, I do think there's opportunity to help all of us by lifting all of us up. Thank you. Uh, Regent Swiggum. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, uh, Chancellor, um, if I could uh, turn to page uh, 219, do you have given us? Um, or it's, it's in our... Um, what, could you describe it? Oh, it's... In fact, we don't even need to do that. Um, the page I'm referring to says that the uh, University of Minnesota Morris uh, uh, ACT median score is 25. Yes. Um, it's of concern to me. And, I, and it, had it been an average of 25, I would not be so concerned. Um, I think at the Twin City campus here, we say our average is 28.1 or something like that. Um, but a median, we're... Uh, having numbers of persons who could be well below, well below that 25. Um, just two quick questions. Are, is there any um, um, concern that we're putting persons in a potential position where they cannot be successful, or are we in any way lowering enrollment standards to, uh, um, to obtain the diverse campus that you have? Um, the median concerns me. Average of 25 wouldn't concern me, but the median does. Chancellor Rear. Chair Omari, Regent Sviggum. Um, we work really, really hard in admissions to make sure that we only accept students who we believe can succeed. And that goes no matter, you know, whatever, whatever their demographic characteristics might be. This has been the um, the um, figure for quite some time, and I believe every year you put every year you showed us. Yes, right, and and I, so I'm, I may be not correct about this, but I believe that um, that number at one time was higher than the number at the Twin Cities, but I'm I'm not sure about that. And over time, as as Karen, you can. Correct me if that's incorrect. So we, we have, as we've had enrollment challenges, not been able to raise that number, whereas you've been able to raise that number on this campus. Is that correct? Provost Hansen? Uh, I, I wasn't here then yeah. either, but I've, I've heard the same story. Uh, fair enough. Again, median concerns me, because that means there are some students there that are probably at you know, at 21 or at 22 or even 19, that we might be put in a, in a difficult position. So again, we, we look at each student holistically and we accept those students that we believe will be successful on our campus. Okay. Okay, fair enough for now. <laughs> Regent Anderson. Thank you, uh, Chair Omari. Um, I, I just need a, a clarification. I, I'm, I'm well aware of the history of the school. The American Indian tuition waiver, 
I understand American Indians go to school free at Morris. Is that? But that's what I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask the how and, and what, what concerns me. It's a budgetary issue. It has nothing against. It has nothing against American Indians going to school there. But I notice in 2017 we had 321 American Indians. That's approximately, as you pointed out, 20 percent of your student body. Uh, less than 10 years ago, it was close to about 10 percent of your student body, and it's went up about 50 percent in those seven years. So how is the University of Minnesota Morris paid to educate those students? Well, I, I'll answer that last part. We're not, right? It's an unfunded well, federal it mandate. Is, it's it's a federal mandate process. that we're not funded from the federal government, one of two institutions. So then the question is, I think, perhaps, how do we pay for it? <laughs> that, and please. So, um, Chair Omari, Regent Anderson. So. I think the fact that the numbers of American Indian students on our campus has grown is a testament to our success in working with that population, and, and that it's a it's a, a good news story. Yeah. But it but it's not a good news story in terms of our budget, and and that is correct. We we struggle so, to meet that. If, if I may, if, if the if the tuition was ten thousand dollars per student, that would be three point two million dollars which would do a lot for the Morris campus. So and maybe President Kaler knows more about this than, than I do. Are there not ways that we can work possibly with the federal government to, uh, maybe it's all been tried. I, I just, okay, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, no, uh, Chair uh, Omari, Regent Anderson, you're not putting me on the spot. It's a, a problem we have uh, been working on for a long time. Um, um, preceding my arrival here six and a half years ago, uh, it's it's a real problem. It is an unfunded mandate uh, from the federal government. Uh, the dollars are simply taken out of our O&M allocation from the state of Minnesota. So if you look at, at the O&M allocation to Morris, it is larger than perhaps it should be based upon a tuition calculation because we don't get tuition uh, for those those students. Uh, we have uh, tried to address this uh, at the federal level through several uh, runs. Uh, the other institution uh, that is blessed with this challenge is Fort Collins. Um, Fort Lewis. Fort Lewis in Colorado. Thank you. Um, and um, they too uh, have not succeeded. We've engaged uh, uh, lobbyists and we've approached the, the government and, at several different levels and it simply doesn't get any traction. So we do not have a solution to the problem uh, currently beyond allocating state funds to support this. Thank and I'll, you. I'll just follow up by saying, I mean, it, it evidently is manageable right now, but if it continues to grow and grow and grow, it, it, it's something. Yeah. So, so we'll, we'll leave that one. I have uh, another question, if I may. Quickly, please. Thank Very quickly. I was surprised to hear, and, and it does put a little light on that, you know, and I live 45 miles from Morris, but it does put a specter on Twin Cities campus. We're out recruiting rural kids to get more diversity here, in my opinion. Is taking away your students. Mm -hmm. um, I was interested to hear that half of your applicant pool has applied here also. So, I mean, that's just a fact I'm interested to hear. Absolutely. Uh, Regent Sue and then Regent Rosha. Thank you, Chair Omari. Uh, Chancellor Bear, uh, welcome again. And uh, I'm glad to hear this discussion. I you probably don't have the answers to these questions, but I'm going to ask them anyway. Um, <laughs> What, first of all, what is, the, what is the true capacity of the school? You know, obviously we have places, we have dormitories, we have professors, we have all sorts of things that can contribute to calculating a capacity. I noticed that your, your uh, peak, in, peak enrollment was about 2,000, 1,946 in 2013, and then it's dropped off including an 8% decrease from last year to this year, and that's not just the incoming class, it's the overall population. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, how, how much space is there really there? And the next question I have, I, I did have a question about the, um, the Indian, American Indian tuition waiver, but we'll get to that later. Um, at one point I believed Morris was uh, test optional, just like following the uh, rest of the liberal arts world, which um, has a large number of test optional schools now, which is your main competition, I believe. I believed at one point I found Morris on a list uh, that said it was test optional or test flexible or whatever the terminology was. 
I don't believe that to be the case today. And if there was a switch, you know, could that be a reason why we're kind of not doing as well in terms of enrollment? Chancellor Baer. Thank you, Chair Omari, Regent Hsu. Um, so let me speak to the first question first and then the second question second. Um, I think capacity is a relative term. So obviously we could probably house and, and take care of 2,000 students, but that might not be the optimal number that we want. And so that's the conversation that we need to have. What's how many students is sustainable? How do we build a campus infrastructure in terms of people that is right-sized for the student population that we think is um, the optimal size? And so I, so I don't have a, an answer for you today, but we will be addressing that. Uh, I don't know anything about the history of test optional. Uh, as I said before, while we do require tests now, we are um, very much committed to holistic review of students. And so it's not just about the test score. Um, I don't believe that, <coughs> excuse me, that if, if there was a change that that accounts for much of what we're experiencing right now. Great, thank you. And Regent Rocha will wrap us up for this agenda item. <laughs> thank you, um, Chair Omari. Um, I'll, I'll lead with the point that I was gonna lead with that goes off of this conversation about the historic um, experience of Morris. One of, the, one of the great surprises after a 20 year hiatus uh, from this board was I came back and, and speaking with uh, uh, the chancellor's predecessor, I talked about, oh yes, the crown jewel of the university. Because when I left in 95, Morris had a measurably higher ACT score than the Twin Cities campus. And, and that was considered the more prestigious opportunity and, and the environment for people that wanted that liberal arts uh, experience, much like you'd find at a St. Olaf or a, or a Gustavus. Um, and so when I came back and discovered that Morris was struggling in this regard, um, at, at first I thought, well, how could this have, have happened? What, what is it that, that has caused this decline? Well, it turns out Morris hasn't declined. The Twin Cities just had increased so much as to create this, this now uh, relationship difference between them. And you know, what I'm really concerned about with respect to the Morris campus is it, it's kind of part of this conversation because this conversation doesn't really have an identity from my perspective. Um, to some extent, we're even talking about does admitting students to the Twin Cities have a negative impact on Morris? And, and I, I don't like this concept that you know, we would look at Morris as being the scraps that you would receive if you're not at the Twin Cities. I don't think that's that's the case. Nor do we. No. Right. And 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 so I, I just want to be really careful about that. But I also want to advocate for the board to 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 be real clear-eyed about what's going on, uh, because my sense is that we are. When you look at these numbers over these last several years and the numbers nationally on campuses of this variety, we could be sitting in, in a position where a future board or even members of this board in a future conversation having to make some difficult decisions about the campus. I don't want to get there. Um, I look at, the, the, we started with the talk about the disconnect with the local area and I think that's a good place to start. Maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe that does matter. It depends on what the identity of this campus is going to be going forward. Um, and, and you know, you look, are we gonna be a, a regional campus that provides a basic liberal arts education to the folks of that area who are comfortable in that environment, you're, you're kind of treading on Minsky's mission there. And, and that would go to decisions we've made in the past about closing campuses that didn't fall within the University of Minnesota's mission as a land grant institution with the research and all the other things that we provide. I think that you have to look at the possibility of excellence. And, you know, and, and, and Morris is different, because when we talk about Crookston or Duluth and you talk about sort of competing in a regional setting tuition-wise, that's one thing. I don't think necessarily being a low-cost alternative uh, at Morris, that, I don't think that's gonna get you the, the students that you're necessarily looking for. Because if you start talking about that, you, you, you might have to start talking about being a rurally focused campus where you're talking about agriculture and other things. Well, now you're starting to step all over Crookston and, and is there enough to do that, I don't. I don't think that there is, but we have to look at the cost implications of each of these of these opportunities. Because when you talk about the tuition free component, Regent Anderson, it's it's really remarkable because we've lost 200 non-native students 
at the same time as increasing 100. So you actually have 300 fewer students paying. I mean, that's, that's dramatic. So thinking of those cost implications, I, I would like to see us have a very specific plan for what Morris is going to look like. And, and when, when we brought you on, I was, you know, I didn't really have a chance to interact with you much, but you've got to be bold. I think you have to be bold for this campus. And I think that this is the, the board has to be committed. As, as you know, you know, when the university catches a cold, right, um, you're a small number of the students competing, you know, you, you know com compared to the Twin Cities overall population. But it also means it's not a tremendous dollar figure to make substantial differences in the way the Morris campus is, is allayed uh, for, or arrayed rather, for the students that are there. So I, I would say we've got to be bold, but I, I really think we need a very clear identity for this campus, for this campus to continue to be a successful component of the, of the university system. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Rocha, and thank you. Could I, could I just respond? Sorry. Um, thank you, Chair Omari, Regent Rocha. I, I absolutely agree with you, and that's why I think this visioning and, and planning process that we're undertaking on the campus is so critical. One of the things that Morris has been known for is being an innovative liberal arts institution, and we really need to think about what does that mean in the 21st century, and how do we get there, and how do we develop a value proposition and a brand that makes us a destination. Thank you, Chancellor Baer, for that. We look forward to the continued conversation. There is a consent uh, agenda item that I will entertain uh, a motion for approval. I will entertain a motion for approval of the so consent. Moved. Thank you. Anyone second? Second. Second. Um, any discussion? It includes um, uh, approval of program changes and uh, hires. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? I'll draw your attention to information items that are just that, information items, and the administration uh, is open to further conversation and comments from the board if there is any. Other than that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. Um,